Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. Uh, welcome, Commissioner Silver and members of the administration. This is a busy day around City Hall with multiple simultaneous committee hearings. So my colleagues will likely be streaming in, as out, in and out, uh, but we expect uh, an exciting morning as we delve into our city's Parks Department budget. And I do want to welcome you uh, to our hearing on the fiscal year 2018 preliminary budget and the fiscal year 2017 Mayor's Management Report for the Department of Parks and Re Re Recreation. My name is Mark Levine, and I am, of course, the chair of the Parks and Recreation Committee of the City Council. In keeping with the budget process mandated by the City Charter that will ultimately lead to the adoption of the fiscal year 2018 budget, today we will hear testimony from the Department of Parks and Recreation on its expense and capital budgets for fiscal year 2018. Park use in New York City is surging. There are now 42 million visitors per year in Central Park alone, double the number who visit Disney World every year. Over 7 million people visit the High Line annually, 5 million visit Bryant Park every year, and on a peak summer weekend, 127,000 people visit Brooklyn Bridge Park. These trends are repeated throughout every borough in parks large and small. But I'm sorry to say that our Parks Department budget is not keeping pace. After decades of decline relative to total city spending, the Parks budget as currently proposed by the administration is set to fall yet again in the coming year. It, it would fall to just 0.58 percent of the total budget in the Mayor's proposed plan with a drop in dollar terms of $19 million and, most worrisome of all, a net drop in staff of 175 full-time employees. For the third year in a row, the mayor's budget fails to baseline $9.7 million for critical park maintenance workers, which would lead to a loss of 50 gardeners and 100 CPWs who would be laid off as of June 30th, depriving our parks of sorely needed staffing and depriving 150 hardworking New Yorkers of their livelihood. This situation is made all the more dire by the threat of the Trump administration to totally eliminate community development block grants, known as CDGB, that the from the federal budget, a move translating to the loss of $4.5 million in funding for the Parks Department, which would deal a near fatal blow to the Green Thumb program, an initiative which relies heavily on CDBG funding for its work to support the city's network of 600 wonderful community gardens. We simply cannot tolerate a reduction in parks resources at a time of record levels of park usage and a growing city population. Rather, we need to make targeted investments to enhance key high-impact initiatives within the department. For starters, we need to continue to grow the number of Parks Enforcement Patrol or PEP officers, since today their ranks are still so thin that most parks at most times have not even a single officer on duty. We need to expand funding for street tree pruning, as rising costs have pushed us back to an unacceptable 10-year cycle for pruning. We need an additional $2.7 million for this important work in order to return to the seven-year pruning cycle needed to keep trees healthy and streets safe. We need $3 million to increase our urban park rangers program by adding 50 new positions on top of the paltry 30 that are in place today. This will not bring us anywhere near the historic high of 200 rangers, but it will provide critical new personnel to support environmental education, outdoor recreation, wildlife management, and active con conservation. We need $1 million for 10 more outreach coordinators for Partnership for Parks. These are critical on-the-ground staff who are working to support Friends of groups around the city. Currently, only 10 outreach workers service the entire park system, giving each an impossibly large portfolio of groups uh, for them to care for. And we need $1.7 million to permanently expand the city's beach and pool season by a week beyond Labor Day. 
We also need to baseline $1 million for fiscal year 18 for stump removal. This was money that was put in the budget by the mayor last year, but not baselined. And in fact, we need to do much more than a million dollars to deal with the unacceptably large backlog, which is into the tens of thousands for stump removal. Now I would like to turn our attention to the capital side of the budget. Under Commissioner Silver, the Department has launched three vital new capital initiatives that have done much to advance equity and access in our parks system. Sadly, none of these programs received additional rounds of funding in the Administration's current capital budget proposal. First is the Community Parks Initiative, and we're calling for a third round of investment in this program, which helps revitalize small, neglected parks in low and moderate income neighborhoods. We're calling for an additional $150 million to support approximately 40 more CPI parks. Second is the Anchor Parks Initiative, which provides a major infusion of capital to renovate heavily used mid-sized parks. We're calling for an additional $150 million to facilitate the renovation of five more Anchor Parks. Third is Parks Without Borders, the brainchild of Commissioner Silver an initiative which makes parks more open and welcoming by improving entrances and park-adjacent spaces. We're calling for another round of investment of $30 million in this successful and popular program. At a time when the city's population has now surpassed 8.5 million and appears headed to a staggering 9 million residents, we also need to invest in the expansion of our park system. Fortunately, there are many inspirational projects on the drawing board throughout the city that would give us the additional green space that we so desperately need in our growing city. Let's build the Queensway, a miles-long linear park that would make use of an abandoned rail line to connect many unserved neighborhoods and central and southeast Queens. Let's also bring some environmental justice to park-starved Bushwick and deck over part of the BQE to create a new green space called BQ Green. Let's undo the damage done to nature in generations past by daylighting Tibbetts Brook in the Northwest Bronx, unearthing a long buried stream to realize major environmental benefits and create new recreational space. Let's build the world's first underground park by turning an abandoned trolley terminal into the low line on the rapidly developing Lower East Side. And let's build on recent city and state commitments to renovate the bathhouse at Orchard Beach in the Bronx by investing in desperately needed upgrades to the surrounding grounds as well. Let's think big. Let's ensure that every community in this city, especially low and moderate income neighborhoods, has a thriving green space. Let's bring spectacular new parks to life for a growing and ever more active population. Let's create a parks budget worthy of this great city. I now want to acknowledge we've been joined by stalwart Parks Committee member from the Bronx, Andy Cohen and major advocate of daylighting Tibbetts Brook. I'm sure we'll hear more about that. And I look forward to hearing now from the administration. And I'm going to ask our committee counsel, Chris Sartori, to please administer the affirmation. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? I do. Well, good morning, Chair Levine and members of the Parks Committee, and thank you for your strong support of our parks uh, and also the other members of the City Council who will be joining throughout this morning. Uh, I'm Mitchell Silver, Commissioner of the New York City Parks and Recreation, and I'm joined here today by a number of our senior staff, including First Deputy Commissioner Liam Cavanaugh and Matt Drury, our Director of Government Relations. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to discuss the agency's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2018. Thanks to the strong leadership of the Mayor de Blasio and a strong partnership with the City Council, I'm pleased to report on the progress we've made over the past year. Our testimony will be supplemented by our report for progress. I believe you all have a copy, which was released this morning. 
Uh, this report examines the status of strategic initiatives that have guided our agency's efforts since the beginning of this administration. As we gear up for the spring and hopefully some warmer weather, uh, we can look back at 2016 as a particularly exciting year for NYC Parks. Our dedicated employees working closely alongside elected officials and supported by thousands of volunteer groups and other park partners continue to implement our vision of creating and sustaining thriving parks and public spaces for all New Yorkers. These efforts reflect our agency's central mission, caring for our parks and public spaces, planning parks that are resilient and sustainable, and thoughtfully building a park system for the present and future generations to enjoy. As I think we can all agree, an outstanding city requires outstanding parks and public spaces. And I'm extraordinarily proud of the job we've done to provide those spaces to residents and visitors alike. Upon arriving to the agency almost three years ago, it's become immediately clear to me that our employees were dedicated, creative, and hardworking, but that there were more opportunities to make our process more transparent, carefully coordinated, and efficient. I made it by my number one priority to look closely at the agency's capital process, and I'm extremely proud of our efforts to bring transparency and accountability to a process that many said was confusing and unwieldy. Today, any New Yorker who is curious about any of our city parks capital projects that is underway can get an update about that project status within seconds of using our capital projects tracker. And the website has seen close to 300,000 visits since its creation. The average time to complete design on our capital projects in fiscal year 2016 was 54 days shorter compared to the fiscal year of 2015, nearly two months. The average construction project in fiscal year 2016 took 99 fewer days in, than in fiscal year 2015. And while I acknowledge that many of you faced frustrating delays on projects you funded, and you will inevitably be able to point to projects in your district that have taken far too long, I would ask that you keep in mind that these process reforms will take time to make themselves felt. As recently funding projects begin to benefit from a significantly improved capital process. I have no doubt that you'll come to agree that we've made important strides toward delivering critical park improvements to your constituents more quickly. On the operations front, we pilot an exciting new model for trash management in our large parks even as we continue to increase the effectiveness and efficiency of our mobile cleaning crews citywide. It seemed clear early in my tenure that we were missing opportunities to directly engage New Yorkers in helping plan for the future of all of their parks, uh, so we established new opportunities for community engagement across the board. With our design process, communities now are telling us firsthand the features and amenities they value most in their parks, so our designs can better reflect their needs and priorities. Our community scoping sessions have included thousands of attendees, all of whom feel invested in the future of their parks because they've helped shape what those parks will become. And for the first time in the city's history, we've encouraged New Yorkers to directly nominate uh, the parks they thought would benefit from our Parks Without Borders new design approach. We received over six thousand submissions from the public, from which we were able to select eight signature projects to receive $40 million in capital improvements. We launched a citywide conversation about how we can create a more seamless public realm with a summit in 2016 that brought together experts and thought leaders, students and community activists to weigh in on the future of the park system. We've now enlisted over 2,200 new New Yorkers in an effort to catalog every street tree in New York City using cutting-edge technology that now allows us to track the caretaking efforts impacting each and every tree. But we recognize there's always more work to be done, and we continue to strive in every way to be responsible stewards of public dollars while implementing our innovative and inclusive approach to ensuring that our parks serve all New Yorkers. Thanks to the support of the mayor and our partners at the City Council, we have deployed additional cleaning staff during the times our parks are heavily used, creating what we call a step-up program to replace staff that have been deployed to beaches and pools during the summer season. 
We hired additional gardeners to beautify parks through our community parks initiative neighborhoods and have significantly increased the ranks of our park enforcement patrol in all five boroughs. At the same time, we're investing $150 million to transform Inger Parks in each of the five boroughs, and to date, the City Council, the City has invested over $318 million in mayoral capital funds through our Community Parks Initiative to re-envision parks and playgrounds that hadn't seen investment in decades. With an operating budget that has increased by 18 percent since 2014 and a new record level $4.5 billion worth of investments in critical park infrastructure in our capital plan. Mayor de Blasio continues to demonstrate the city's commitment to building a more equitable park system for all New Yorkers. And now I'd like to introduce Matt Drury, our Director of Government Relations, to help provide more context and detail about the agency's efforts as we head into fiscal year 2018. Thank you, Commissioner Silver, and thank you to the Council uh, for the opportunity to testify today. I'd like to begin by outlining some key facts and figures that will help illustrate the scale and diversity of what we do at NYC Parks. We're the steward of over 29,000 acres, 14% of New York City's land mass, including 10,000 acres of natural areas. We oversee nearly 4,500 individual properties, ranging from parks and playgrounds to community gardens and green streets. There are currently 515 active capital pro uh, contracts for parks improvement projects, 190 of which are in design, 148 are in procurement, 177 are in construction. The preliminary budget for fiscal year 2018 reflects the agency's ongoing priorities, providing for operating expenses of $487.5 million, a significant increase over the preliminary budget for fiscal year 2017. The preliminary 10-year capital plan, in combination with the current fiscal year, provides a total parks capital budget of $4.5 billion, with $657 million in mayoral funding for approved new capital needs. The mayor's preliminary budget reflects a strong budget for NYC Parks, as this administration continues to invest the resources we need to get the job done. In this budget, there were several key additions to the 10-year capital plan, including $82 million in funding for street tree planting, as well as significant investments in critical state of good repair items, retaining walls, boilers and HVAC systems, playgrounds and comfort station repair, park bridges, investment in our agency vehicle fleet, and safety upgrades for our recreation and nature centers. While these additions may not make headlines, they are critically important to sustaining our parks and recreational facilities into the future. The mayor's budget allows us to continue delivering on our framework for an equitable future, released in October 2014, which says served as our guide in delivering meaningful improvements to our parks and public spaces. In fiscal year 2018, we will announce 11 new capital sites set to receive park improvements through the Community Parks Initiative, our agency's signature effort to distribute city resources in a fair and focused manner. Launched in 2014, the Community Parks Initiative has invested $318 million to date in mayoral capital funding to strengthen parks and public space in under-resourced and high-poverty neighborhoods, transforming more than 67 sites citywide. The positive impact of CPI is already being felt in communities all over New York City. Since the launch of CPI, over 2,100 community representatives have participated in 45 design meetings, allowing park users, neighborhood leaders, community board members, and elected officials to provide input on the future design of their neighborhood park. Neighborhoods across the city have benefited from immediate, high-impact improvements completed by our in-house crews, and we're pleased to report that we expect to cut the first ribbons at some of our CPI sites this summer. In the meantime, our Partnership for Parks uh, outreach coordinators have engaged with 50 park groups and enlisted over 12,000 volunteers for park cleanup projects in our CPI neighborhoods. Younger park visitors have benefited from new programming, thanks to the Playground Associates and Urban Park Rangers we've deployed to these neighborhoods. Last year, we had over 500,000 visits to our programming sites. Our parks are an essential part of our urban fabric, anchoring neighborhoods, enriching lives, and supporting communities. Our newest initiatives focus on designing and building our parks with the entire public realm in mind. To that end, in 2016, we launched Parks Without Borders, a new approach to park design. It focuses on the accessibility and connectivity of three main areas within our parks, the entrances, edges, and adjacent park spaces, which are the places where parks and the surrounding neighborhoods interact most directly. We've applied this design approach in a few ways. We've allocated $40 million of mayoral funding to construct a set of eight showcase projects, receiving large-scale capital redesigns. We dedicated an additional $10 million to help expand the scope of some existing capital projects already <coughs> in process. And when and where appropriate, we're seeking to incorporate design philosophy into new everyday capital projects. Design on these showcase projects should conclude by the end of this calendar year, and we look forward to introducing these reimagined spaces to the public by early 2020. Given the needs of a fast-growing city, 
A commitment to equity also means we need to continue improving our parks and playgrounds in all neighborhoods by updating aging infrastructure and adding green space to areas most in need. In August 2016, Mayor Bill de Blasio and members of the council joined us in announcing an investment of $150 million for major improvements at five large parks, one in each borough, known as the new Anchor Parks Initiative. These parks act as anchors to their surrounding communities by providing large, diverse recreational resources. Through Anchor Parks, we will invest in new resources like soccer fields, comfort stations, running tracks, and walking pads, transforming these parks for the 750,000 New Yorkers who live in the neighborhoods that surround them and make these older parks feel new again. Each of the Anchor Parks is a key community asset, and the $30 million in mayoral funding for each site will make a major impact. We're happy to share with you today that all five of our Anchor Park projects are well into design for their initial phases and have benefited from well-attended public input meetings so that the priority improvements at each park can be shaped by the local residents that know these parks best. We anticipate completing design by the end of 2017 and getting construction underway by later next year. But beyond making significant capital improvements to our parks and facilities, we're working to improve our management practices to ensure cleaner, safer, and more enjoyable park experiences for all New Yorkers. Our dedicated maintenance and operations staff do their best to keep our parks in the best condition possible, and new programs are making their work more efficient every day. You may recall that in recent years, we expanded our Operations for the 21st Century pilot, aka Ops 21, to increase the effectiveness and efficiency of our mobile cleaning crews citywide. With new performance guidelines, the pilot yielded 500 extra hours of cleaning time each day, the equivalent of an additional 63 full-time staff. Complementing these performance guidelines, we launched a new playground repair and inspection program, deployed additional cleaning and horticulture staff at peak and weekend times, and recruited new seasonal step-in staff to make sure our parks and playgrounds stay clean while we simultaneously expand our focus to our beaches and pools. But we continue to seek to innovate. In this past year, through a successful partnership with the Central Park Conservancy, Cortona Park in the Bronx was a site for a trash management pilot program overseen by our innovation and performance management team, which produced impressive results. We're also pleased to announce the creation of a new senior management position, a deputy commissioner uh, serving as chief operating officer to oversee our borough and citywide maintenance and operations teams and to help us continue finding smarter ways to marshal our resources. Lastly, as more and more people rely on smartphones to access information, we're working on the mobile optimization of our agency website to make sure that New Yorkers and visitors can have up-to-date information about our parks and programs at their fingertips. At the same time, we're using technology to collect previously unavailable information that can help us make better decisions about our resources. In one pilot program, we've placed SUFA benches, solar-powered smart benches, throughout Highbridge Park in Manhattan and the Bronx to gather visitation data to better create maintenance schedules, programming opportunities, and park designs. The use of technology and the exciting initiatives that support it can greatly improve our ability to care for our parks. With this data in hand, NYC Parks will be even stronger stewards of our thriving urban forest and natural areas. Our street trees create a tree canopy that reduces both air pollution and the heat island effect. Over 10,000 acres of natural areas throughout the city, including forests, wetlands, and dunes, provide both protection from the elements and a unique opportunity for New Yorkers to connect to our natural environment, which also includes abundant wildlife, over 600 species, to be exact. This past year, NYC Parks helped launch Wildlife NYC, a campaign to increase public awareness about urban wildlife in the city, from soaring hawks to curious coyotes, to help New Yorkers live safely and harmoniously with the wildlife that call New York City home. 2016, NYC Parks also completed our ambitious Trees Count program, which surveyed and cataloged street trees in all five boroughs. Over 2,000 trained volunteers participated in the survey using mobile devices to map 130,000 city blocks containing 666,134 street trees of 132 different species. Utilizing this data, we launched an online street tree map, which brings New York City's urban forest to your fingertips. The map allows every New Yorker to access information about every street tree in New York City and allows users to mark trees as favorites, share them with friends, and record their caretaking and stewardship activities. The street tree map tells a story behind every street tree in New York City, encouraging more educational and stewardship opportunities. Furthermore, through a partnership with the City Council, we are exploring how to post more information about our street tree maintenance efforts online. Information such as tree pruning and tree planting schedules will help give New Yorkers greater transparency into our forestry operations and will connect them to our urban forest like never before. But a healthy tree canopy is just one element of creating a strong and resilient New York City. The devastating impact of Hurricane Sandy illustrated the importance of our city's coastline, including the 156 miles managed by NYC Parks, which accounts for 25% of the city's coastlines. Parks and green space absorb stormwater. Dunes and wetlands protect our coastlines. Together, they create the critical infrastructure needed to keep our neighborhoods strong and resilient. 
Since 2012, we've established new coastal dunes, rebuilt the Rockaway Boardwalk, and continue to restore our wetlands, all of which help to protect our communities. In collaboration with city, state, and federal partners, we replenish beaches and are renovating facilities to better withstand flood hazards. We're also collaborating on the design and implementation of integrated flood protection systems along the coast of Staten Island, as well as a 2.4-mile stretch of Manhattan's East River waterfront. NYC Parks is protecting inland communities with new green infrastructure, natural elements, or engineered systems that manage stormwater. Through a network of forests, wetlands, street trees, and green streets, we're encouraging stormwater management that relies on plants and trees rather than sewers and rivers. In partnership with the Department of Environmental Protection and the Department of Transportation, NYC Parks is expanding bioswales and permeable paving in neighborhoods that experience flooding during rainstorms. As the Commissioner noted earlier, we remain laser-focused on improving the efficiency of our capital process, and we saw tangible results in 2016. Comparing projects that completed design oops, sorry, in fiscal year 2015 to fiscal year 2016, we were able to reduce the average time period for design by 54 days, nearly two whole months. In past years, only 20% of our project designs were being approved by the Public Design Commission on their first submission, but that approval rate is now 83%. We automated and standardized the process to compile our contract books, it used to take two weeks and now can be done in only two hours. In fiscal year 2015, the agency processed 407 change orders, which can delay construction considerably. After a dedicated effort, in fiscal year 2016, we reduced the number of change orders by 78% from 407 down to 90, and nearly a quarter of our fiscal year 2016 construction projects were completed over 30 days earlier than their scheduled construction completion date. The average construction project in fiscal year 2016 took 99 days fewer than in fiscal year 2015. Keep in mind, these improvements are all being made in the context of the highest volume of individual projects ever seen by the agency. As we mentioned earlier, over 500 separate capital projects currently underway. As our agency-wide efforts and initiatives look to support sustainable and equitable park development, on a day-to-day -day basis, we rely on our expert staff and our partners to invigorate our parks and public spaces through our placemaking efforts and creative programming, thanks in large part to support from council members. Throughout 2016, our Shape Up NYC classes turned parks in all five boroughs into fitness studios. Park events like Winter Jam, Fall Field Day, and Street Games transformed our parks into winter wonderlands and playful destinations. In our playgrounds, more than 660,000 kids participated in our Kids in Motion program. And in our outdoor theaters, we screened almost 500,000 movies for thousands of New Yorkers. 500. Five, sorry, we screened almost 500 movies for thousands of New Yorkers. Sorry. <laughs> Our urban park rangers <laughs> led hiking, canoeing, and birding outings, giving nearly, nearly 45,000 New Yorkers the opportunity to explore the natural beauty of our city. Through our public art program, 81 temporary installations were on view in our parks, and in partnership with Uniqlo, $200,000 in grants will allow local artists to showcase their work in park spaces that have been historically underserved by cultural programming. In addition, maintenance was performed at more than 500 park monument sites throughout the city, helping keep these historic and important assets in top form. In our pools, almost 32,000 children and adults participated in Learn to Swim programs and at our public beaches. Our committed lifeguards helped protect New Yorkers as we again prevented any drowning fatalities during our beach season. At our recreation centers, veterans and people with disabilities can now purchase an annual membership for $25 a year, same as uh, young adults and seniors, while we reduce the fees for tennis permits in half. All of these efforts are driven by our commitment to robust community engagement and we're grateful for the thousands of volunteers and dozens of nonprofit partners who work side by side with our staff to care for our parks. We recognize thriving parks and open spaces require not only dedicated staff, but strong nonprofit partners and enthusiastic volunteers who make our parks beautiful and active centers of community life. Partnership for Parks, our public private program managed jointly with the City Parks Foundation, supports a growing network of individual advocates and organizations dedicated to their local neighborhood parks and green spaces. Partnership for Parks equips local leaders with the skills and tools needed to transform neighborhood parks and green spaces into dynamic community assets. In 2016 alone, Partnership for Parks supported over 700 community groups, encouraged close to 25,000 volunteers to participate in stewardship projects in hundreds of parks. Green Thumb, our community garden program, is the nation's largest urban gardening program, assisting over 600 community gardens, including 41 new community gardens in 2016. This expansion is thanks in large part to the permanent transfer of 34 previously temporary community gardens. It's, the, it's going to be the largest single addition of permanent community garden space in more than a decade. Green Thumb works with nearly 20,000 garden members across New York City through education workshops and events. 
Thousands of members and volunteers donate nearly one million hours every year to community gardens that provide New Yorkers with access to safe, open spaces and fresh, healthy food. In fact, this Saturday, March 25th, Green Thumb will be holding its annual Grow Together conference, focusing on how to sustain our community gardens. We hope you're able to join us for what should be a wonderful day. Our nonprofit partners, such as conservancies, cultural organizations, zoos, environmental centers, historic houses, and community-based organizations, help provide a diversity of activity and support for our parks. In 2016, several of these partners continued their efforts to enhance the Community Parks Initiative, and as of this date, are on track to meet or exceed their initial commitments. A few examples. The Prospect Park Alliance has led design and public engagement efforts on two CPI parks. The Randalls Island Park Alliance has helped improve and program Thomas Jefferson Park and is now working to organize community stakeholders along the East River Esplanade. And the Central Park Conservancy has undertaken 25 renovations at 15 different parks, helped train 68 CPI gardeners, and provided expertise towards our new waste management pilot for Cretona Park in the Bronx. The progress we've made in recent years is a testament to the hard work and dedication of our parks employees and thousands of volunteers partners, and park users. In accordance with Mayor de Blasio's vision for parks equity, they've all played vital roles in making our parks, and by extension our city, greener, healthier, and more beautiful. Uh, now I'll now ask Commissioner Silver to offer some closing thoughts. Thank you, and we understand that our parks are as essential part of our urban fabric, anchoring neighborhoods, enriching lives, and supporting communities. In nearly every measurable way, New York City Parks has thrived in these past three years. The Parks at Boys Initiative and the Summit set forth a new vision for parks across our city and around the world. The Community Parks and Anchor Parks Initiatives are bringing hundreds of millions of dollars in capital investment to renew precious neighborhood assets. Our coastal resiliency work has brought beachgoers back to our beaches in droves, and the scores of targeted initiatives and improvements across our system brought immediate impact to everyday park users. These actions provide a deep and solid foundation upon which to grow. And we are now able to bring greater equity and innovation, more advanced planning and placemaking, and a higher standard of care to every single one of our sites. Our park system is strong and growing stronger. Thank you for allowing us to testify before you today and for your dedication to providing great parks and open spaces to all New Yorkers. We look forward to continuing work with the mayor and the city to create a bright green future with a more equitable and innovative park system. We value your participation and thank you for your support of our agency. And now we will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Commissioner Silver. Thank you, Matt. I want to acknowledge we've been joined by much beloved Parks Committee member, Council Member Alan Mazel from Brooklyn. Uh, Commissioner, am I right that park use is surging? in New York City, and if so, do you have numbers for total park usage relative to historical figures? We do know that parks uh, at visits are increasing. Uh, there are several parks that actually document the numbers. You've mentioned Central Park, 42 million. Highline actually is at 8 million. Prospect Park, 10 million. Flushing Meadows, Corona Park, 10 million. We estimate that in terms of visits, not visitors, that now we're getting uh, over 130 million visits to our, all of our parks each year. That includes beaches and pools. So uh, we have not compared it in past years, but based on what's happening in the parks that do track numbers, we are seeing an increase in park usage in our city. Those are big numbers, and it's impressive, and it bodes well for the future of our city, I think. So in that context, how do you justify cutting 170 staff for the, do I have that number right? No, we actually have an increase of 55 staff from fiscal year, from last year. We, our full headcount was at 4188, and right now the preliminary budget has it 4243. Okay, but there are 150 gardeners and maintenance workers which are scheduled to be cut, correct? Uh, right now what, what, it is. What's the logic there? Uh, as you know, we're still in the budget process. This is a conversation we have every year, and so we're uh, very eager to continue a conversation between the mayor's office and city council uh, about those 150 positions. You know, the, the public doesn't always appreciate just how much work it takes to maintain a heavily used urban park, but with 130 million people visiting our system, uh, there is an, uh, an incredible amount of work we have to do in maintaining these spaces. and. Uh, even in this technology, is, this technological age, that requires men and women on the ground, and uh, gardeners and maintenance workers are critical components of our park system. Uh, it's tough work. 
in hot weather and cold weather, but it, it must be done. Uh, what impact do you project the cut of 150 of these positions will have on the park system? In all cases, uh, we always sit down and figure out how to be as efficient as possible with the staff that we have. As was stated, we now brought on a new uh, deputy commissioner for operations. Uh, as you heard also, by being a lot more efficient uh, through our optimization of our mobile crews, uh, we were able to save 500 hours, which is the addition of 63 full-time employees. We also shifted toward uh, placing our staff at high destination parks over the summer to make sure they're clean on the weekends. We hadn't done that before. So we're getting smarter about how to use our park resources. And so if, in fact, uh, the 150 is not continued, uh, we're always prepared to sit down and figure out how we could be more efficient uh, and to use the existing staff that we have. But again, we know this is still an ongoing conversation. We're early in the budget process. And so we're eager, through the mayor's office, to continue to engage the city council on these 150 positions. Well, look, the story of the Parks Department in recent years is that, that you've been ever more creative in how to stretch a dollar. But at a certain point, you can't do more with less. You're going to do less with less. And in the case of these 150 workers, aren't they allocated to CPI parks? And are you saying that in their absence, you'll find cuts elsewhere to maintain the staffing level in the CPI parks we or efficiencies elsewhere, as you might put it? We continue to look how we optimize our mobile crews, and you had mentioned partnership for parks. In terms of the number of volunteers that are coming out, now those are one-shot events that happen throughout the year, but we're seeing uh, a lot more people coming out in the neighborhood to support their parks. Uh, we're seeing people uh, obeying park rules and just enjoying their parks a lot better as they recognize these open spaces are vital to living here in New York. Uh, but we continue to look at ways of being more efficient with the resources that we have. And again, we'll continue the ongoing conversation of what we can do with these uh, 150 um, uh, employees, CPWs, and gardeners. Uh, understood. Um, you know, the, the mayor is, has prided himself on moving beyond the era of the budget dance, and we applaud him for that. But this would be the third year in a row where uh, the councils had to put money in for these workers. And uh, in cases where it's of, of exclusive interest to the council and the mayor doesn't want to fund it, you know, there's some justification here, but these are workers which have become integral into one of your signature programs, which is CPI. So the fact that the mayor is not baselining it and that we are left uh, with a very heavy lift of, of, I think it's 11 million or 12 million uh, roughly, uh, to uh, 8 million, forgive me, uh, still quite substantial. Uh, to me, it's, it's, it, it, it sure feels a lot like a dance and, and one that I, I regret we're, we're finding ourselves in again. Um, you did mention that, that people are obeying park rules more. I, I don't know if there's actually data on that. It's great to hear. But the data that we do have uh, coming out of reports on crime in parks, I believe, shows that uh, we are up this year relative to last year. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, and what, what is the percentage increase? I believe it's about, uh, I think it's 6%? 5%. So, so maybe my data is wrong, but I have, uh, I guess I'm looking at FY16 versus FY15, uh, the number of fel felony crimes against persons in city parks rose from 488 to 612, which is a 28% increase. And I'm actually not seeing numbers for the first two months of this year, but I believe that trend has continued. In my so the numbers yeah. I have that I'm reporting on is that for the uh, fourth quarter of 2015, it was 230, and then from the fourth quarter of 2016, it went up to 243. Okay, you're, you're comparing quarter by quarter, so maybe that's the issue. But again, I have F FY15, there were 488 crimes against persons, felony crimes against persons, FY16, there were 612 felony crimes against persons. So far, the first four years of FY17 uh, were showing 219, sorry, 245 felony crimes against persons versus 219. So uh, we're not counting Central Park in those stats. Uh, so that's a 28 percent increase. Uh, last year, we're working on an 11.8 percent increase this year. My mistaken in those overall numbers? We, we can agree we have seen an increase in parks. Uh, 
We are sitting down on a regular basis with NYPD. Uh, we are noticing we're getting more people in our parks. Uh, the weather is warmer, uh, but we're now sitting down to actually target uh, those 12 percent of our parks where crime does occur to figure out how we can work with NYPD to do, because again, our park security is for, focused on park rules. NYPD is our partner in dealing with, with crime in our parks. And we're also looking at what they call SEPTAP, is community, uh, is crime prevention through community design. Parks Without Borders is one example. So for those parks that we are seeing uh, higher levels, that we now want to sit down with the commanding officers and determine where it's taking place in the park. So one, they can work on increasing their patrols, but we could also work on through planning purposes. Is it lighting? Is it shrubs? What is it about that place that is creating some of the crime? So we can use other strategies to determine how we can start to work with NYPD uh, to address or make our parks safer. All right. Uh, the, 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 the striking context here is that crime in New York City is down. And that's a huge achievement for the city, for the NYPD, something the mayor is rightly proud of. Uh, it's been down to record lows. So in that context, the increase in parks crime uh, raises red flags for me. And it's not only property crime. I didn't focus on that. One could understand that when you have more people coming into parks, there might be more iPads that go missing. But we are talking about crimes against persons, uh, which uh, it seems hard to explain away merely by the increase in park usership. Is, 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 do you have any other theories uh, for the cause of this increase? Again, we're working with uh, NYPD. Um, we, certainly they take the lead on crime-related matters. Uh, clearly our PEP work with them very closely to determine uh, how we jointly can address this issue, as well as our borough commission, is something we do take very seriously. Uh, what I was just sharing with you is that we are seeing uh, more people using our parks. The city is growing. Uh, while we recognize that there's a difference to the overall crime rate, it's still uh, about 1 percent of all crimes uh, within the city occur in parks, and it covers 14 percent of the footprint. But we are looking at other strategies. Those parks, those 12 percent, and again, we have about uh, data on about 1,100 parks, that we're beginning to focus on where they're occurring within the park. And then if there's a specific location, we want to see if there's another intervention uh, through the planning purposes uh, through what we call SEPTAP principles. You, you referred to PEP officers as primarily focused on park rules, and, and that is the case. Obviously, in part, we want them to prevent illegal barbecues, but they are police, effectively. Not effectively, but they are police. They have arrest powers. They carry handcuffs. They, uh, in many, many, many cases, have intervened uh, in incidents far more serious than Ill illegal barbecuing. They uh, often stop violent crime in action. They can, uh, they, they can apprehend uh, suspects when necessary. Clearly, they're interfacing with the precincts and are, are in direct radio contact with them. That itself is a really, really important function. There have been many incidents where uh, it was the PEP officer who uh, made the, the quickest uh, alert to the PD, um, and, and that's just the power of having that person there. So uh, to me, the question of the budget for PEP officers uh, is quite relevant now, and it's been really great that we have roughly doubled their ranks in the last three uh, budget cycles, but let's not lose context of the numbers here. We're at, I think, about 360 PEP officers. Do I have that roughly? Uh, well, when fully, when we have everyone on board, it's about two, 292. 292, so I was overstating. And then another so. 31 of the urban park rangers, which also can serve right. the same purpose. So how many PEP officers are currently on board? About 255. So 255. So this is a city of 1,900 parks, 30,000 acres. Uh, and you don't need a degree in mathematics to realize for most parks, most of the time, on most days, throughout most of the year, there's not going to be a PEP officer on patrol. That's the experience of park users, one that, that I hear about in every borough of the city as I, as I travel to parks. Um, this is a concern for people, not only because they don't want illegal barbecuing, but also because of broader concerns about safety. Right? So, so uh, how do you envision such a tiny force patrolling such a sprawling park system? Well, first, let me just say that our 
Parks Enforcement Patrol are unsung heroes. I agree with everything that you've said. They've saved lives. Uh, they are providing education. Uh, they're also enforcing park rules. So I agree they're a very critical asset uh, to keeping our parks enjoyable and safe. Uh, as I stated before, we continue to work with NYPD. They're our partners on addressing crime. Uh, we have deployed both task force and, and uh, mobile patrols that can get to more parks. Uh, but we can continue to have the conversation um, you know, in this budget process. Uh, but as you stated, we baselined uh, additional 67 PEP officers last year, and that was the mayor's commitment to move forward to make sure we even have more of our parks enforcement patrol out there in our parks. Understood. So I referenced uh, fear of cuts by the Trump administration in my opening remarks. There's been a lot written about this in the, the two weeks since the Trump administration offered a budget blueprint. Uh, and great alarms have been raised and it's justifiably about the impact on public housing, on our police department, on our schools. But the public needs to understand that there is essentially no arm of New York City government that is not vulnerable in an era of severe federal budget cuts, even the park system, and, uh, which you are well aware of. And that is in part because we get uh, community development block grant money, which I believe, if I have my numbers correct, is uh, it's 4.5 million a year for the park system. And I think the single largest chunk of that, a million or more, goes to the green thumb. Could you confirm whether, like, could you confirm what the total amount of federal funding that the Parks Department receives a year is and where that money goes and what kind of contingency plans you have in the face of such cuts? Well, the number you mentioned, the 4.5, is the correct number. Uh, but right now, we believe it's still premature. Uh, the mayor put out a proposed budget. We understand Congress is the one that will adopt that budget. Uh, we're in con constant contact with both the mayor's office and OMB that as we see this budget process move forward, uh, we'll make some determinations at that time. But it is 4.5 of our budget of close to half a billion dollars. So what, what happens to Green Thumb if they lose a million dollars? We'll have that conversation as the federal budget becomes a reality, uh, and we'll be looking at what are the options that we can do. But as you know, that the Green Thumb program is a vitally important program to the city and those gardeners that, that use it, as well as everyday New Yorkers that benefit from these uh, treasured green spaces. There's probably not uh, there's probably not a dollar that we spend in city government that gets more mileage than the dollars we spend on Green Thumb, just by the sheer number of parks properties they touch and by the multiplier effect that it achieves because of the uh, volunteer efforts that so many New Yorkers are placing in those parks. So while a million dollars in Green Thumb in the context of uh, some of the billion dollar sums we're fighting over in the budget might not sound like a lot, it would really be felt in this city and be felt in these, these really important parks properties. I know you value community gardens. I know you value Green Thumb. And I, I would just urge the department to, uh, to contemplate ways we can shield uh, this important program uh, if indeed we do face uh, the kind of devastating uh, cuts which are now being proposed uh, uh, by the Trump administration, to, to my profound regret. I'll also mention, though it's not officially your purview, there's been talk about cuts to the National Park Service, uh, including comments about privatizing the service. Uh, there's currently a hiring freeze in the National Park Service, which is um, really devastating when you have seasonal hires, as they do. Uh, it calls into question how they're going to hire up for the summer rush. People don't understand that there are no fewer than 10 national park properties in New York City, including beloved, beloved sites like Grant's Tomb, like the Hamilton Grange, like Castle Clinton, and of course, the Statue of Liberty. So, you know, in this context of budget cuts to the National Park Service for properties in the five boroughs, the potential for cuts to uh, funding that is directly being deployed by your department to parks throughout the city, uh, I want to make sure that we do not uh, inflict any wounds on ourselves by cuts like the 150 parks and uh, gardeners and maintenance workers, which are currently on the chopping block. 
So uh, I'm going to pause right now uh, to see if uh, my, I think my colleague, Councilmember Cohen, has a question, and then Councilmember Mazel, do you have a question as well? All right, wonderful. Councilmember Cohen. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Excellent. Um, uh, one of the topics, uh, crime in parks, I'm, I'm very concerned about uh, the Williamsbridge Oval. We've had kind of persistent low-level crimes, and I think we had a shooting there recently. I am concerned about uh, what we could do to try to make uh, that park, which, although it's not my biggest park, I think it is, you know, as heavily used per square foot as any park in the city. So I don't know if you have thoughts on what we could do generally in terms of, you know, the shortage of PEP and trying to make right. that park in particular a little safer. Uh, Councilmember, what I mentioned earlier is that I've instructed both our assistant commissioner over our urban park service uh, program as well as the borough commissioners to start working with NYPD and looking specifically at some of the places because NYPD is our partners at dealing with crime to see if there is a, another approach uh, through what we call SEPTEP crime prevention through environmental design to see as we uh, work with NYPD to address some of those hot spots, are there other approaches we can take to address some of the specific issues. Uh, that is the approach that we're going to take. Uh, because we have our patrols that could are very mobile in terms of our PEP, uh, we're trying to see exactly how we can focus on some of these hot spots uh, throughout the city. Uh, we get crime data, but we don't get specifically where it's occurring, so we want to meet with the commanding officer and NYPD to see whether we can try some new approaches uh, to address what we see as a, a slight increase in crime in our parks. If I could just add, uh, specific to the Oval, uh, we have, it's a unique nature because a lot of it's after school and we're aware, so we're actually uh, working our closely, our borough commissioners working with our public programs division, trying to uh, think up some creative ways with recreational opportunities, because I think to some degree there's sort of a youth engagement strategy that's also going to accompany uh, the efforts that the commissioner took as, uh, spoke of as well. I'd really appreciate being kept in the loop on that because it, it has been a, a concern and, a, and it's a growing concern. My chair, who has been also a, uh, a zealous advocate and partner on, uh, on the daylighting at Tibbetts Brook, uh, I, I don't sit on environment and sanitation, so I can't complain about DEP's lack of involvement. But could you just talk a little bit about sort of the, the, the role ultimately, you know, how the two agencies are working together on, on this project? Because I do really think that DEP should be you know, more of a partner. I know parks advocates want to get the job done, but I do think that it would be helpful and important if DEP stood up as, as partners here? Well, we're engaging a consultant. We're actually working with DEP on the first phase of the daylighting for Tibbs Brook, uh, so DEP uh, is involved. Um, whether we want to sit down and have a meeting to talk more with both agencies, but it's something that we would not move forward with this project uh, without DEP. There is a design project. There's, there's no funding to actually do uh, any capital work, but at least we're going through the design process to see how we can daylight that first phase of Tibbs Brook. But DEP is actually uh, involved. Um, we're taking the lead with the consultant, but DEP is also involved. I know there's a lot of multiple moving parts in order to get that project really to be meaningful in terms of water waste management. I'm sure uh, my excellent borough commissioner reported on our meeting with our U.S. Senator's offices and trying to get uh, some progress on, uh, on the Putnam Trail, the, the southern end of that, the CSX property. Uh, I just, you know, I had a question about your testimony. When, when you mentioned that capital projects were 99 days ahead of schedule, like in FY17, uh, how, how do we, what does that represent? I mean, if a project was started three years ago, is it 99 years, uh, 99 days? <laughs> we haven't gotten quite to that point yet. Is it 99 days ahead of schedule over the course of the three years? What? Well, the, the 99 days was what we were able to compare from 2015 to 2016 for the construction phase. There are three phases of a capital project design, procurement, construction. So we're able to measure the period of time for construction phase from FY15 to 16, and that's where we saw an increase in 99 days. Uh, there was another number. A decrease, a decrease in 99 days. Decrease, okay. correct. There's a decrease of 99 days. The 30 days were the number of projects that actually were completed uh, ahead of time. Uh, but the, that was an important measure, that three months. We worked very closely with wrench and engineers. Uh, we do uh, pre-site investigation, and so there have been some benefits of some of the things we put in place to bring that construction phase down. So that's just a construction phase of the project. Um, I don't, I, I don't want to give you a hard time, but I'm just curious, is, is, it, ap is, it, is it a true apples-to-apples -apples comparison? I mean, if you had a, a very substantial project in, yeah, in FY? Yes. 
It is. It, okay. It's an apples to apples comparison. All right. Um, I'm just going to keep bouncing around a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, I, <laughs> it's not my district, but I, I have a uh, deep interest in, uh, uh, in uh, the Rockways, and I was just curious. I see that uh, it, the boardwalk is not currently complete. It was my impression that it was. It, it will be fully opened. Oh, I didn't There's care. a partial. Gonna, okay. I, I will. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know what? You know what? I, I care deeply, but I will definitely. I didn't see you there. I'm going to move on then. Okay. Uh, how about Orchard Beach? Uh, in terms of Orchard Beach, as you know, there was uh, uh, there are it's about a fifty million dollar project. Uh, there is some money both from the city and we expect from the state. Uh, but to do that project and move forward, we need uh, approximately $50 million. So it's something that uh, we'd like to move forward. Uh, we'd like to make sure that the governor's commitment to $10 so, million. So, sorry, not to jump in. So you have $50 million. No, no, no. The budget to do the project would be $50 million. And how much is in place now? Um, 30 in state funds. I think we have... 30 in city funds. Yeah, 30 in city funds. And but there's also there, state funds, too. Correct. correct. There's a $10 million. There's a $10 million from the, from the governor. And we're discussing the state. Right. So even to do the bathhouse, we're not fully funded? That's correct. So th to renovate the bathhouse is how much? Uh, our project oh, so cost Sorry, Councilor. No, no, please. We have to clarify this. Okay. So right now the project cost is $50 million. Uh, and there is $30 million in city funding that's in place. Uh, I'm sorry, $20 million is from the mayoral funds, $10 million from the borough president, and we hear there's about another $10 million coming from the governor's office. That puts us at $40 million. Okay, well, 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 I'm first trying to get over the fact that it takes $50 million to renovate a bathhouse, uh, which, is, which is an extraordinary, extraordinary high number. But uh, I was under the under, I was under, I understood that we were at full funding for the bathhouse, but you're telling me that we're still $10 million short on that. It is the bathhouse and the plaza. Uh, the building has to be stabilized and uh, restored, and then believe there's going to be uh, some access at the lower level where they used to permanently used to be a concession, but also the plaza area. Got it. So you're not proceeding on this project because you're still $10 million short, or you can... We're looking to see what we can uh, pursue. We also have to make sure it's ADA compliant. Uh, so we're going to see what we can do with the $40 million or if we have to wait for it's fully funded. But it's a project we're committed to going forward by virtue of the mayor uh, giving this capital project $20 million. Okay, we, ha we have a, a disconnect between what I'm hearing from some of the leadership in the Bronx, which had told me we had the $50 million. We'll, we'll, we'll square that. But when, 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 assuming that it is only 40, which would be unfortunate, when do you hope to clarify whether you can proceed on that basis? Well, we'll have to meet with staff because we cannot proceed with a project unless it's fully funded. So either we have to change the scope, but it's something that we can certainly meet and get back to, uh, to, get back to you on exactly a better estimate of how we believe we can and, and the, 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 the broader grounds, this is a large, it's a large park, it's a large property, uh, none of that would be touched even if you had 50 million, right, except for the, the plaza right in front. But is there a price tag for a broader scope that would include the grounds and the pass and the I access points? I believe there points? was a study. I'd have to get back to you on what the larger budget would be. Uh, I'm just right now focused on the bathhouse in the immediate area, but we can certainly get you that number. All right, I'm going to pass it back to our, our colleague from the Bronx. I just make the point that this is an unbelievably heavily used beach. Uh, it is the only beach for a huge part of the city and, and communities that are not going to the Hamptons on the weekend. They, are, they don't have that access, they don't have the economic ability to do that. So Orchard Beach is just hugely important, hugely used, uh, vital to millions of people. And so while the price tag is considerable, if you look at the impact, uh, it's actually uh, a fairly modest amount per user and, and one that I would certainly support. So I'm going to pass it now back to Councilman McCullen. Uh, thank you, Chair. I really do appreciate your advocacy on this issue. And, and, and the $50 million, just to be clear, I, you know, calling it a bathhouse, but it, it involves the whole colonnade, and it, it, it is in, unfortunately, this, we've not been as good a stewards of that facility as we should have been because it is in very, very deteriorated condition. So although that does sound like a staggering amount of money, uh, I'm, I'm sure it, could, it, it will you know, all be used. Um, so I do uh, uh, appreciate that. And, and I also do believe that as a delegation, at one point, we did get a briefing, a budget presentation of the whole, of the whole multi-phase project. And I, it might have been, it was well over $100 million, I believe. 
but I think I've covered all my territory. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Cohen. Councilmember Maisel. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Um, as you may know, I represent uh, Marine Park, both the community and the park. And uh, my, pre my predecessor uh, and myself have put a lot of money into Marine Park, I think up to maybe 12 million plus. Uh, last year, I asked uh, that the oval in Marine Park be repaved and the Kitty Park, uh, which is adjacent to um, the Carmine Carroll House, uh, be um, uh, rehabilitated. Um, it didn't happen last year. Um, I, I'm not sure if my letter for this year was sent out yet, but we're again to uh, renovate the oval. Uh, it's a huge amount of money, $8 million for the bicycle path and the oval, plus a couple million dollars for uh, the Kitty Park. And because Marine Park is a regional park, thousands of people use Marine Park uh, during the summer every week. Um, I'm happy to put a lot of my capital money into parks. Um, uh, maybe two-thirds of my capital money goes into parks. But I don't have the kind of uh, resources to, uh, to keep up with the demands and the wear and tear in Marine Park that we have uh, every year. So I urge you to take a look at uh, those, those projects, and uh, I'm willing to sell it for one of them. So well, I'm sure you could certainly follow up with our newest borough commissioner, Marty Marr, uh, and I'm pretty sure he's up to date on your request. If not, uh, he should schedule a meeting very soon yep. so we get the full breadth of, of some of the projects. Well, I'm going to be meeting. actually meeting with uh, Commissioner Marr uh, very, very soon, like tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but uh, I want to just make sure that you know uh, my feelings about uh, how important Marine Park is uh, to the entire borough, the largest park in, in uh, Brooklyn. It is the largest as, park as, in Brooklyn. As, as you know. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Councilman Maisel. And we're going to pass it off to our colleague here in Manhattan, Councilmember Kalos. Thank you, uh, Chair Levine, for your leadership, and uh, thank you, Parks Commissioner uh, Silver. In 2014, I came to this budget hearing and noted that the East River Esplanade was literally falling into the river and that if we let it fall into the river, it would be $430 million to rebuild it or it would cost us $115 million not to make it as great as the west side, and I do demand that we make the East River Esplanade better than the west side, uh, but just that it would take $115 million to shore it up. Uh, in that year, we were able to secure $35 million. Uh, we have finished phase one and two of that $35 million, and we now, instead of $115 million, which I asked for previously, we are now requesting $169 million to keep that work on track. And so, uh, Commissioner Silver, I want to thank your team for their great work and uh, ask if you will continue to fund the uh, shoring up of the East River Esplanade so that it does not fall into the river. Well, all I can say is that uh, we do agree with you, that uh, we're very pleased. Uh, actually, we have $42 million from phase one and two that went into stabilizing the Esplanade, and we recognize that more work, work needs to be done. Uh, and we'll continue to have conversations with the administration about getting additional capital dollars to improve the Esplanade. And, and thank you. And this is uh, an issue of importance to Council District uh, 5, as well as my, my neighbor to the north. We actually split the Esplanade, which runs from 60th to uh, 125th Street. And a lot of the work that we've already secured has been benefiting both the Upper East Side and East Harlem. So again, thank you for the work. Uh, on a uh, separate note, uh, the east side, uh, my council district, District 5, actually ranks fourth from the last uh, for open space. And so we're looking for it anywhere we can. I want to thank you for opening 2,000 square feet and doing a ribbon cutting, and the community is still excited about it because we now have peer space that can be used as park space. Uh, however, we have about 50,000 square feet, an acre and a quarter, uh, that's under the Queensborough Bridge. It's called Queensborough Oval. And in my lifetime, I had never actually been able to be there because uh, there has been a private lease for the entire park uh, for the better part of 40 years. And uh, I, even on a city council member's salary, I can't afford the 180 to $225 an hour to play tennis there. I've asked other folks from Parks Department if they would play tennis with me there, but none of us seem to be able to, 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 to part with that uh, $180 to play. And 
in so I understand that certain members of the public may have $180 uh, to play tennis there, but they certainly don't live in my district, uh, uh, and uh, they don't live in the surrounding area because I haven't actually heard from anyone in my community other than asking to return the space. And so we've worked with Community Board 8 for the better part of my entire first term. We've passed, we've had 14 meetings, we've passed four resolutions. Uh, the borough president, our congress member, our state senator, uh, and, and I and our assembly member have all asked to please not renew the lease and to open it back to the public. I, for one, am willing to put capital funds, but can we please deprivatize a park in the city and uh, add public space and a brand new public park? For our clarification purposes, uh, the space underneath the Queensboro Bridge is a Department of Transportation uh, property. Uh, a lot of people affectionately call it a park, but actually is a Department of Transportation property which is being used as a concession. Uh, but as you before know that, we've that it, was, it was a park before it was a concession because we've had people at community board meetings testify that they played softball there, that they ran on a track there. So it has historically been used for parks purposes and even now is being licensed through parks. It's being licensed through parks, but uh, it is a property, it's a city owned property, but it's now under the jurisdiction of a department of transportation. I can't answer what happened prior to the concession. It's been there, I'm told, some 30, 40 years. But as you know, going forward, uh, we uh, have met with many stakeholders, including uh, our elected officials. We have both a short-term and a long-term plan. The short-term uh, is to continue, uh, make a recommendation to continue the lease on a year-to-year -year basis while we explore some of the long-term options. We have not come up with a determination yet of what that long-term op long -term option is, but we'll continue those conversations with both you, your colleagues, elected officials, as well as other stakeholders until we can come up with a resolution. But for the time being, we are recommending, uh, which we did share with the community when we met with them, uh, depending on how long the conversation would occur, that we would have to uh, extend that license agreement until we come to a long-term solution. I think there's an overwhelming concern, at least by me as Chair of Governmental Operations, having overseen uh, Rivington and now Water's Edge and others, anytime we see a private vendor who's paying, I believe, just over two million dollars for an acre and a, half and a quarter of city space, which is far below market, and making several millions of dollars a year, and not having to compete <coughs> against a free market or compete against other providers. We we have similar arrangements, not quite with groups like Asphalt Green, where over 40,000 children play, but we're not seeing anywhere near the number of people there, and we're not seeing access to this space for low-income families and uh, the community as a whole. So I guess uh, the concern from myself, all the elected officials, and the community board is just that uh, allowing it to lapse into yearly renewals is not responding to the community. And, and I believe that I, I work for the voters, and parks should also be working for the residents of the community. Uh, we continue to listen to stakeholders on both sides of the issue, those that would like it to continue and those that would like it to uh, somehow become a, a open space. As I stated, we have both a short-term recommendation as we explore some of the long-term options, and that is the process that we're continuing. Um, but we're always willing to sit down to talk to anyone that wants to talk about this further, uh, but that is what we've shared uh, with the community, uh, with the elected officials, uh, but we don't have a final recommendation of what the long-term use should be. I, I guess the the Last piece, and I believe the Riverside Clay Park Tennis Association is in uh, Council Member Levine's uh, district, but that's a tremendous model where parks property with clay courts on it is maintained by the Riverside Park Conservancy and this sub entity. And we've got these great clay parks, and if we could replicate that model and have work with them to be custodians of this, we could tomorrow. Uh, cancel the license and still have a tennis use there, uh, but we could replicate the success that you've had on Riverside. So once again, we're slightly envious of the west side on the east side and hope for uh, similar services. Well, you don't have to be envious of me on that one because those are in Councilmember Rosenthal's district. <laughs> but the, the truth is that we do have a model for a public run tennis court. And I don't think that Councilmember Kalis is against tennis. I gather he has a pretty good game. But that 
under the public managed model, it's, it's a $100 annual fee, and thank you for reducing that. Uh, that's certainly increased usage. There's clearly a budgetary impact if it's going to be a publicly run entity with those lower fees. But I think what you heard Councilmember Carlo say, and what I would echo, is that let's have the conversation about what the budget would need to be. On the capital side, probably there's millions of dollars of backlog needs there. And then on the operating side, um, and ultimately I would argue that it's, there's a public benefit served by that investment. And I would, I would add my voice to, to the council members in, in, in pushing for those kind of creative solutions uh, for public access and public space, uh, no matter what agency has jurisdiction. Uh, I want to acknowledge we've been joined by uh, many of our wonderful colleagues, including uh, Council Member Ulrich, uh, our Majority Leader, Jimmy Van Bramer, uh, Parks Committee members from Brooklyn, uh, Council Member Mark Traeger and Darlene Mealy. And I believe that uh, Councilman Traeger, you have a question, is that right, sir? Okay, we'll, we'll, hit, we'll do you next. And then I know we have Council Member Ulrich uh, and, and the others as well. And uh, Van Bramer and then Mealy. Okay, take it away, Council Member Traeger. Uh, thank you, Chair Levine, and welcome, uh, Commissioner. I just want to begin by, uh, again, just saying that uh, it was definitely tough to fill the shoes of Brooklyn Commissioner, former Commissioner uh, Jeffries, but uh, we, we are thrilled and we applaud you on the appointment of Commissioner Marty Marr. It's good to call you Commissioner now, Marty. <laughs> um, I, I just want to begin by uh, re reading through your comments. Uh, the, the issue of the investments in anchor parks throughout the boroughs and, and the community park initiative, which I, I do appreciate. Um, and I mentioned this at a, at a previous parks hearing, but I believe it's important for the commissioner to, to also, I think, hear this, is that uh, we're still concerned about the issue of uh, not just recovery, but resiliency in neighborhoods that I represent. Um, and there are certain there are certain parks that have not gotten the love and the attention which they've needed for quite some time, particularly in areas that are prone to flooding and emergencies. Uh, there are still parks, for example, in Coney Island that are called parks but are completely concrete. And we've heard, you know, from DEP and other sister agencies the importance of trying to green up uh, these parks. Um, and so, uh, forgive me if this was asked before, I was in an education committee hearing, but um, is there a plan to continue the Community Parks Initiative this year, and is there a way to loop in resiliency initiatives and goals? Uh, for example, there's a park in Coney Island called Surf, Surf Playground that is, not, is near a school and just predominantly you know, concrete. Uh, and, and that's something that, that should be an example of a park that's being converted to green space for, for, for more than one reason. So I just want to hear your thoughts first on that. In, in terms of uh, community parks initiative, our focus uh, for this budget and the capital budget is really state of good repair and, and making sure we're holding the assets that we have. And uh, if you look at all the major capital items, it's really a state of good repair. Having said that, for all of our community parks initiative projects, uh, DP is heavily involved and resiliency is part of each project. Uh, I believe a majority of the community parks initiative uh, have some element of uh, sustainability working with DEP where there's stormwater retention uh, on site. So the answer is yes. But in addition to that, we always look very carefully on how we plan and build uh, all of our parks within floodplains. It's something that is the first step we take when we're designing a park. So to answer your question on Community Parks Initiative, yes. In parks in general, yes. Uh, but in terms of the CPI uh, for this budget, uh, right now we're announcing another round uh, this fall. Uh, but this budget uh, is now focused on state of good repair. But so there will be a, a, an announcement of more parks as part of this initiative, is that another correct? 11 sites this fall. Uh, and you ha have you picked those sites already, or are they? Uh, I, right now, we have a general list when we did our analysis a few years ago, so we'll be looking at that list uh, to make the determination. So right now, it's still a conversation. Uh, and, and I'm and not now. just advocating just for my district. I, I think that all of the communities that are vulnerable and, and prone to uh, flooding and also that have not been, uh, that have been really neglected for quite some time. W one thing about Sandy, it hit areas that were historically neglected period, uh, Coney Island, Red Hook, Canarsie, you name it, 
Uh, these are areas that needed some help for, for quite some time. Uh, so I would really like to work with your, with your departments on making sure that we loop in these resiliency goals uh, as well. Uh, I also saw that the, uh, the allocation of about $150 million to transform anchor parks in each of the five boroughs. And I remember, I remember reading, there was recently an announcement uh, that the mayor, uh, I think, I believe with your agency and, and, and Deputy Mayor Lisha Glenn, uh, a big investment in Bushwick Inwood Park to keep uh, a promise that was made by the previous administration to purchase land to convert it into a future park. And I, I'm all for increasing green space. But I just want to again remind the Parks Department that there was a promise made by the last administration to a uh, really a big space in southern Brooklyn, uh, and Commissioner Mark uh, gave me the right pronunciation, Calvert Vox Park. Is that correct, Commissioner Mark? That's uh, correct. All right. Thank you. Uh, where they had promised, uh, I think, over $70 million or s somewhere around that figure of $40, $70 million, a huge investment uh, that was made to transform into a regional park. Uh, all that was really done was a, a, a parking lot and a few soccer fields. Uh, I don't know the last time you've been to, to this physical space, but it, it has such enormous potential. Uh, it's also tied into EDC's study for resiliency in that region, and I've told the EDC point blank that in addition to pr the protection of life and property and, and resiliency, we need to enhance our public asset, uh, which is Calvert Box. Um, it, it, it is just crying and, d and dying for investments and resources, and I'm going to demand Brooklyn's, Southern Brooklyn's fair share. Um, it's not physically in my district, but it serves the entire Southern Brooklyn region. So I just want to hear your thoughts well, uh, on Calvert Vox. Well, Councilmember, I listened to you because you mentioned Benson Hurts Park, and I went out there for a visit yes, and you did. documented it. And so you do know there's some intervention there. And I also went out to Calvert Vox as well. Uh, there is a conference station uh, that's on its way in addition to the ball fields, uh, soccer fields, which are absolutely some of the best that I've seen. And I also took a walk through the other area of the park until I got to the waterfront. Uh, and I do agree it is a park that needs investment. So it's one that I'll uh, continue conversations uh, uh, with the administration. But I have heard before, I did not know the number was 70 million. Uh, I thought the number was a lot smaller. Uh, but it's certainly something we'll take into consideration as we continue our conversations. Well, I, I appreciate that. I believe it was originally somewhere in the, in the 40 to 50 range. Then they, the estimates increased. But it's going to take about at least $70, $80 $80 million, I think, somewhere in that region uh, to, to actualize that vision of a great lawn and, and really things that the community does truly uh, deserve. So I, I would really uh, just like to work with you. And, and last point I'll make, because I want to be mindful of my colleagues' time, uh, the chair and I are proud to work together on the Parks Equity Initiative uh, in, in the City Council. Uh, and this was about making sure that we are um, uh, you know, activating spaces that historically have not been activated uh, throughout the entire year and building up ca capacity in neighborhoods. Just wanted to hear your thoughts on, 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 on how that program is going from your end, whether there are additional needs. Uh, we need, you need more funding uh, to, to kind of, I, we really want to make this not just a part of a budget dance, but a part of the norm here in the city of New York that we are creating fair, equitable opportunities across all regions of the city. And just want to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I thank you and the council for that funding. Let me just share with you uh, from the uh, City Parks Foundation that where th the money went, it was able to either partially or fully fund eight staff members at the Partnership for Parks who really worked to provide technical assistance to communities. So all those communities have benefited from those funds. Uh, in addition, there was about another 667000 that went directly to parks. We've used that to activate a lot of our parks. Uh, that included community events, movie nights. As was stated, we had over 500 this year, uh, additional playground associates, and improvements to a number of community gardens. So all of the, the funds that the council provided actually did go to work, and there was another 775000 that was also uh, given out to various groups to put their own projects in. So. Uh, the initiative itself was highly effective, and, and we thank you for it. And again, I heard your concern about how we can continue this going forward. Uh, we'll certainly make a note of that as we continue our conversations with, with the mayor's office 
as the process continues. And please let us know if there are capacity issues, let us know now so we keep this program afloat and strong and make it a part of the norm in our city. And just to the last point, I know it's, we're not yet in beach season, but always keeping our eye on, on staffing levels and, and staffing outreach. Uh, are there any concerns or any uh, thoughts or where we're at? I'm not sure if this question was asked about uh, ha has staffing recruitment begun for, for the seasons ahead or any? It's you mean, it, the regular staffing, this, believe it or not, uh, during the snowstorm last week, uh, we already started working on the staffing plans okay. for the beaches. So we start early. It was nice as we we're talking about beaches. The snow was falling, but it is what it is. It is spring officially. Uh, I don't know, Commissioner Kavanaugh, if you want to add anything else. Uh, as Commissioner Silver mentioned, we began our formal beach preparation process last week. Uh, all things are uh, in place or working towards being in place uh, for Memorial Day weekend, uh, specifically with lifeguards. Uh, we have a, a really strong class in training right now, over 300 applicants, uh, and we think we're going to match last year's numbers of almost 1,500 lifeguards uh, working in New York City beaches and pools next summer. So no concerns at this point? No. Very good. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Traeger. Next up, we have Councilmember Ulrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I realize I'm a guest of this committee. I'm not a member, so I'll be prudent with my time. Um, and, Commissioner, I want to apologize for being late today, but I did get a chance to review your testimony. And I just want to let you know how pleased I am to work with uh, Commissioner Lewandowski in Queens and uh, her fine staff at the Queens office. They do a phenomenal job helping my district. and. Uh, before and after Hurricane Sandy, and I know that you know that already, but uh, some of those events and uh, things that they were able to help us accomplish were before you uh, taking over the department. And it's always good to see uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh. He was a uh, big presence in the Rockaways last year. So I have a few questions about uh, the Rockaways in particular, and I know that uh, my summer constituent here, because <laughs> I, won't, I won't tell the people in this district that, but in the summertime, uh, Councilmember Cohen spends an awful lot of time in, in the ponds it. But anyway, so um, um, a few questions. First, about um, capital projects. So we, we've seen, and we are very grateful for the extraordinary investment that Parks has made uh, with respect to capital projects on the peninsula, both in my district, and I know Councilmember Richards, I don't think he's uh, here with us, but I know he certainly appreciates all the capital money that the city was able to put forward um, while we waited for FEMA to give us our um, allotment, if you will. Uh, the boardwalk is 99% done, I think we'd say. I mean, it's almost there. I mean, we're very... By Memorial Day, it'll be there. We're very pleased by that. Um, um, we were very pleased that our federal partners were able to secure more money than I think the city even anticipated, to be quite honest, and um, we're very grateful that the administration has agreed to reinvest a lot of that money in the community. Uh, but one of the concerns that I hear from folks on the community board and in the community is that uh, they are concerned that parks might be using some of the FEMA uh, allotment that we're receiving, or reimbursement money that we're receiving, uh, for other pro parks projects that are sort of related to resiliency but not quite rebuilding parks and doing things. For instance, this parks facility, a $30 million garage, uh, that's what it's being coined and referred to as locally, but people in the community are saying, hey, Shorefront Parkway is not fully rebuilt yet, we don't have all of our park space up and running, and, you know, Parks Department gets more money than we even asked for, and they want to take $30 million of that money and build a garage. So maybe you want to address some of those points. Well, first, uh, in terms of the total cost, uh, when the recommendation was submitted to FEMA, uh, we split the cost. So the full $30 million was not submitted. It was about half of that amount, with the other half uh, would be coming from the city. So that was uh, the first uh, item. Secondly, uh, we communicated, and Commissioner Lewandowski was very clear, that this is a hub. This is the first line of defense. Uh, when a storm is coming, both to prep for it, uh, it is not elevated. It was damaged during Sandy, so it is eligible. Right now, they're operating out of temporary trailers, and if a storm is coming, they have to move all their vehicles further away, which reduces their ability to do storm prep. So this 
hub, transit, this hub would take care of not only the Rockaway, but 130 other sites in the peninsula. It is vital to the operations, the boots on the ground. The same as having a precinct in a neighborhood is the same as having this. You don't want to just have uh, police deployed from other areas. You need that location on site. So we see this vitally important to resiliency, the boots on the ground, where they would have their operations, an elevated structure that would not get flooded the last time it was flooded and hurt the ability for storm recovery. So uh, we agreed not to put the full amount forward. It's only partial funding. And so, uh, uh, and we also included uh, seven items in total. We heard the community, and so we made sure that it was evenly distributed uh, throughout the peninsula. That's great. Um, with respect to the capital uh, budget process, you know, one of the frustrating things for us to deal with as elected officials is that we have a limited amount of discretionary money. You have scarce resources of your own that you have to distribute throughout the city. Um, one of the concerns is the cost of these capital projects that, you know, we asked Parks Department, hey, how much would it cost to fix this a ball field or this playground or this, uh, you know, tennis court or whatever the project happens to be. And not only just in Rockway, I have, you know, so many of my constituents use Forest Park and, and so many playgrounds and park spaces in between. And the costs are just so high. And then we hear, and I don't know if this is actually true because I'm not a member of the committee, but that a third of that cost actually goes to uh, the architectural slash internal costs of the Parks Department, the fixed costs. Is that so if the project is one and a half million dollars, is the actual construction only cost a million dollars and 500,000 is going to park? Can you clarify that for me? Let me clarify. There are two separate questions. So let me first go on the cost and second I'll go on our projects either on in-house or with consultants, which what you're referring to. In terms of the cost, we share your concern. Uh, we put out for competitive bid, and this is what the market is telling us it would cost. And we're doing everything we can by standardizing our designs to help bring costs down. Uh, but even the New York Building Congress uh, stated in their annual analysis they're seeing prices going up 4% in 2016, and they expect it to be the same again. And to quote them, they said that this means a stretched labor force, increased use of overtime, and an ability for contractors to pick and choose which projects they pursue is causing an increase. This is something we do not control. We're doing our best with estimating software, uh, with doing non-customized design and having more templates to help bring the cost down. We're still getting the higher uh, bids. So it's something that we're open to hear any ideas, but it's just the nature of where we are uh, in the market. Uh, in terms of what you were mentioning about the cost, uh, what happens when we uh, recommend consultants to do design on some of our projects, uh, it, there's uh, the 10, 10, 10 that you mentioned, 10% uh, of the project cost is charged for design, 10% of the project is charged for construction supervision, and then 10% is contingency. So it's not 30%. Uh, when we use consultants, it's that 10% I mentioned, that we uh, pay them for design and another 10 percent for construction supervision. Uh, so that is, uh, is not a third of the budget. That, that part is not correct. You know, so many council members now participate in uh, or use participatory budgeting in their district to engage their constituents to get ideas about what they'd like to see with respect to parks and libraries and DOT. And I think that um, some of the feedback that I've heard from many of my colleagues is that parks has been less than flexible uh, with respect to the type of projects that you would allow in the participatory budget process. My office, for instance, uh, Robbie, who works for me, submitted 14 projects, ideas that we got from people who serve on the community board and on the steering committee, and 13 out of the 14 were rejected by parks. I mean, clearly, 14 is more than just a handful, and 13 out of 14 were just flat out rejected by the capital folks at the Parks Department, and I would ask that maybe you take a look at internally uh, their approval process or their willingness to accept certain capital projects that might be uh, included in the PB process. We'll, we'll certainly take a look at it. I know that when we knew the process was starting, we wanted to make sure that what was capitally eligible and in projects that fit within the park was discussed up front. Uh, so we'll certainly circle back and have a conversation with staff about that. Several years ago, we funded and, and approved and, and um, allowed a, a handful of projects in Broad Channel and in Rockaway, and then we found out that that was not the actual cost of those projects. And I'm, I'm now in the third year, and I'm still going to be funding some of those projects. So 
I, I, would, I would almost appreciate it more if Park said, no, it's going to cost a million and a half instead of 500000 or 800000 because then it, the community says, well, we voted on this three years ago. How come we haven't seen a shovel in the ground yet? When is it going to start? How come it costs all this money? Nobody told us this. So it's not that I was being duplicitous or that you were even being duplicitous. I just think that we have to put a lot more thought and, and consideration into how some of these projects are planned, designed, funded? Are, are they going out to outside consultant? Are they going to be done in-house? I don't know, but that's something that I think we need to uh, work on. Lastly, Chair, um, Rockaway is undergoing a tremendous renaissance. You've been out there many, many times. I've seen you personally, even on days when there's you know, no events. You just pop in, and we appreciate that. And we have a, a very dynamic Parks Administrator and Portia Danforth. She's doing a phenomenal job out there. You should know that. But we have tens and tens of thousands of additional people coming to our beaches, and we're grateful for that. But we need more staffing, especially on the weekends when uh, the hipsters invade. Uh, they come in from Brooklyn and they come into my district, or from, hey, hey, or, hey, from hey, hey. or from the Bronx. Uh, when the hipsters come from the Bronx, oh, he, met, he left. I guess he got him back. Oh, there he is. He's over there. But when they come from other boroughs, other parts of Queens, and they want to enjoy the beach, um, you know, the garbage is piling up on the beach on certain days. The, you know, the, I think that the lifeguard hours need to be looked at. This is a, a conversation that Liam and, and I have had for a number of years. Yeah. We need more staffing. We need more staffing in the, in the beach season in the Rockaways. That's my plea. Well, uh, thank you for calling me a hipster because it's one of my <laughs> favorite locations where I can run five miles continuously and get a nice breeze. Uh, so you know, we had uh, 500 peak seasonal staff last year and quite a few went out uh, to the Rockaway. I actually did a detail of cleaning all the cans of one hot August day. Uh, so we'll certainly look into that, but we purposely are deploying uh, more weekend service, particularly at our beaches, to make sure we keep up with the demand of some of the trash that's collecting. But I'll certainly check with staff. But uh, I've been there a number of times. I haven't seen that, but maybe it was a day I was not there. But uh, we value this incredible asset, and you're right. It is a beautiful place, and more and more people are coming. Commissioner, thank you. Chairman, thank you again. Thank, thank you, you. Councilmember Ulrich. So for those hipsters who are planning their summer beat schedule, can you clarify whether there's money in the budget for extension of the Rockaway, Bar Rockaway Beach and other beaches and pools beyond Labor Day by one week? It, it is not in this budget, but I will defer to Commissioner Kavanaugh about some of the numbers uh, that we experienced at the tail end of uh, the, 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 the period of time where the beach was extended. But there's currently not uh, in this budget. Okay, so you're, you're going to tell us that it wasn't well used last year, is that right? <laughs> He's just going to give you the numbers. <laughs> Uh, in comparison to 2015, there was a, a marked increase in beach attendance in the extended week in 2016. It was approximately 263,000 uh, in uh, 2015 and over 400,000 in 2016. So there was an increase there. Uh, for the first year we extended the, the pool season, uh, there were about 50,000 users in the pools during the seven-day extension. Uh, we don't have a basis for comparison in the prior year because this is the first time the pools were extended. But looking back the prior week in 2016, the week before Labor Day, we had about 90,000 attendees at the pools during that week, as opposed to 50,000 uh, in the extended week. So uh, it, it's very much uh, you know, weather dependent in 2015. Uh, as you may recall, uh, you know, we had uh, cooler, rainier weather on the weekend of that extension. Uh, this year we, we didn't have uh, such a drastic change in weather, uh, and I'm sure that it helped to account for the increase that we saw uh, year over year at the beaches. And then it's weather dependent. It also depends on when the school calendar falls. Uh, there can be extra days after Labor Day that are, that are still school holidays. Uh, but I, I would caution you, it, it seems like where you might have been heading is to a statement that use at the beaches is justif justifies the extension but not use at the pools. Is that, is that where you were heading? I didn't make such a statement, okay, but uh, good. I think the, the jury is still out on that. But okay. you know, the numbers that we saw at the pools were, were certainly less than at the end of August, which is a traditionally a slower time period. Uh, and I don't think we know enough about whether or not it's going to grow um, in coming years. Right. And I, I just need to say that you know, we are always concerned about having the, uh, the appropriate number of lifeguards to safely provide 
uh, swimming, especially at the beaches. Uh, at the pools, we're able to uh, you know, cordon off areas and limit use. At the beaches, it's much more difficult. And uh, while our lifeguards you know, have done a great job during both extensions, uh, many of them have commitments outside of their, their work with us during the summer. And so we're not right. always able to predict exactly how many staff we're going to yep. have to supervise this. All right, well, look, there's an equity issue that we've spoken about in the past between pool use and beach use. And the reason why we want the season extended for both is it's a question of fairness. And while the hipsters flock to the beaches in Rockaway and elsewhere, um, two-thirds of the users in our city's pools are uh, people of color and generally uh, from the surrounding neighborhoods, and they, they tend to be located in communities of color. And there's a similar pattern in the lifeguard force, whereas the lifeguards in the pools are more likely to be uh, men and women of color and more likely to be from the neighborhood. And it's really uh, an inverse of that at at the beaches. So we've been advocates for extension of both of these wonderful resources uh, and we were grateful for the inclusion in the budget last year for the extra week and certainly disappointed that it's not in this year's budget and we'll be pushing very, very hard for that in the negotiations uh, in the months ahead. I want to acknowledge we've been joined by our colleague, Councilmember Johnson, and I want to cue our Majority Leader, Jimmy Van Bramer, for a question, who will be followed by Councilmember Mealy and then Councilmember Johnson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner, I wanted to uh, follow up on a conversation I had with uh, your Chief of Staff yesterday. Uh, just because I think it's important that these things be on the record. Um, uh, in relation to Queensbridge Park and the Park House project, which is horrifically delayed and uh, which we're uh, terribly unhappy about. Now, uh, I have uh, great respect for your uh, Chief of Staff, uh, who we've done a great deal of work with over the years and yourself, but I just wonder, if, if you can speak to where we're at now, when the people of Queensbridge uh, can expect that project to be done, and, and also uh, uh, more globally, there was a discussion that what happened at Queensbridge Park with this park house, uh, you've now made changes to the way you do these projects, and so therefore we can expect far fewer kinds of nightmare scenarios like this going forward, and, and I would just like to hear you uh, speak to that, um, because what the, the time frame that we now are looking at, as I understand it, for completion at Queensbridge uh, is, is, is a great, great distance from when we thought we were going to have the park house done, and um, you know, all jokes aside about, about hipsters going out to the Rockaway, uh, which is great, uh, there aren't that many hipsters going to Queensbridge Park, um, but the people who do go to the Queensbridge Park um, are my constituents who live in the Queensbridge houses and the Ravenswood houses, and they deserve a, a first-rate park. We've done some great work there, as you and I both know, but, but this one is, is not a success story. So maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, uh, where is that now and when the right. Parks Department believes it will deliver right. the Queensbridge Park Park House and then uh, more globally the changes that have been made that lead uh, your staff and I assume yourself of course to have more confidence going forward that what happened there won't be happening anymore. Well, to answer specifically, I understand you met with uh, uh, at least the staff had updated you, my chief of staff, that I believe it's close to going into procurement. Uh, procurement has a sliding scale of seven to 12 months. Of course, we try to push it to be at the shorter end, and then construction is anywhere between 12 uh, to 18 months. But again, we've I testified earlier that we're now seeing uh, huge savings, at least about three months on the construction side. So uh, the news is not good, but it could at least be a couple of years before it's completed. Uh, I did call you after uh, you expressed your displeasure, and we did bring it up at one of our critical meetings where we discussed uh, projects that delayed, and that answers the second part of your question. Uh, we now, on a monthly basis, uh, have a meeting uh, where uh, if projects uh, are challenged going forward, there are issues I need to know about, uh, we discuss it right away before the delays start to pile up. Uh, and I make sure that the council member is notified, that we understand the nature of the problem. There are, at any given time, eight reasons why a project is delayed. 
but I also inherited a lot of projects that were already in the pipeline before I got here. This was one of them, and many of them had experienced delays in the past. So this meeting is important. At any given time, we're going over five to seven projects, and I'm trying to figure out how to make it move forward or to deal with some of the issues that are out of our control that we have to share with the, either board president uh, or the council member. So this is a vital meeting. We call it Red Zone, and it's something that we sit down and figure out what's going wrong and what can we do uh, to make this project move forward or uh, deliver the not so pleasant news if there's an issue that's just out of our control, a contractor defaulted, uh, an unsuccessful bid. There could be a variety of reasons why a project gets delayed. But at least we're seeing that less and less uh, going forward. So since I mentioned it to you at the last Parks Committee meeting and it went into red zone, I take it, uh, or it was, was more for an update uh, because you wanted me to get more familiar with what was going on. So it was brought there really to talk about what had transpired with this particular project. And so that's where staff was sharing me exactly what had happened along the way. And there was a series of unfortunate events uh, that caused it to be delayed. So at least I was more knowledgeable about what had transpired. I think this one dated back to 2013, I believe. Uh, yeah, about 2013. Right. So I, I guess my question is the fact that it, it has now come to your attention and, and uh, is it, is it, uh, has it changed anything uh, in terms of if it gets into the red zone discussion or meeting, then is, is that resulted in the Queensbridge Park Park House project moving any more quickly? Right now, if it's moving toward procurement, that is the process I have the least control over. I think the unfortunate events that happened happened prior to procurement. Uh, clearly, we're trying to work uh, through procurement to have it on the seventh month side and not the 12 month side, and that is something that staff's going to push, working with all the relevant from law to MOX to OMB to make sure it moves through the process. We've been getting great cooperation from all entities, uh, and then for construction, we want to make sure that we have a resident engineer that makes sure it's done safely, but it's done as quickly as possible. So it's, it's March, and right. we believe we're going into procurement, and uh, I was told that we can expect construction to start uh, in early 2018. Uh, is that something you feel comfortable with? Yes. And that we would have the park house uh, completed uh, in, in 2019. Correct. And and um, maybe an 18-month uh, period, right? So we could conceivably have the park house in the summer of 2019. Correct. Uh, so I just wanted to have that on the record. Uh, we're going to hold you to it. I know you will. Uh, and um, you know, I, I know you know how important this is, and and uh, the good people of Queensbridge deserve nothing but the very best, and. That's why we've put so much money into Queensbridge Park and have, uh, have really helped transform that park. This is an important piece of that. I think you know that. And the sooner that an abandoned park house gets torn down and we build a beautiful new state-of-the-art structure is, is, for me, a sign to the children of Queensbridge and, and all of the people of Queensbridge uh, that the city uh, understands and values that park because the children shouldn't be playing uh, baseball in the summer little league that I sponsor in the shadow of an abandoned park house. I don't like what that says to those children. I know you don't like that either. So the sooner we tear down that building and, and, uh, and show the images that I've seen of the amazing structure that's going to go up uh, in its place, uh, and I want to share those images with the people of the district because it's, it's maybe the nicest park house I've ever seen. Um, uh, you, all, you all design. We want that in Queensbridge Park as soon as possible. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Majority Leader and Councilmember Mealy. Hello, Commissioner and your staff. Um, thanks, our borough. Our former one, Jeffries, and the new one, Marty Marr. I want to say thank you for all that you have done in um, Brooklyn, and especially I could say at least about 90% of all our parks are done. But you were talking about the competitive bid contracts for conference stations. Have y'all tried any other contractor in regards to these conference stations? That I remember we just did a. a I could say about a $10 million park, Imagination Playground, second in the world in Brownsville. And here it is, the architects, I know I asked for a comfort station, 
but it's not there. And now we have this state-of-the-art part, and now I have to put two million more in for just a comfort station. So I'm saying, how can we do a little better with these comfort stations? That's a lot of the capital budget that we could be putting into schools. When, if we get a competitive bid, if they say a comfort station is 800,000 or 1 million, that's a good, you know, deduction from 2 million. So have y'all thought about going to a different contractor? I know it's an open bid, but maybe the, the same person is getting the same bid. And you know, parks have a little issue with same people getting the same contracts. Have you ever tried a new contractor somewhere or another, or someone had to do a lower bid than this one contractor? We put it out, and we will accept the lowest responsible bidder. Uh, I share your concern. When I got here, it was under two million, it is now approaching three million. And, That's a problem. Uh, as I stated earlier, um, uh, we met with the the industry, uh, they recognize prices are going up across the board uh, here in New York, and they expect it to continue. Uh, we are experimenting with one comfort station uh, in good. Staten Island where we have in-house staff doing it. It's not building a new one, in-house renovation. We've even gone to standardizing all of our comfort stations to a template. And even with the template, we're experiencing different prices in different locations. So this is something that is out of our control. We are open to any and all suggestions. But what we've done is we've come with a standardized template so that wherever the comfort station goes, we can compare uh, one project to the other. And we sit down uh, with the contractors, my staff, and sometimes evaluate what is pushing these prices uh, to go so high. So. Uh, Essentially, I can quote to you what the Building Congress said, but it's a product of uh, a very tight market, a desire for overtime. Uh, all these issues are pushing. It's really not on the material side. That doesn't change mm. that much, but it's just in terms of just the demand uh, for uh, contractors here in New York. So going out to others, we do that now. We put out to bid, and we want the more uh, to bid so we can get a very good price. Thank you. I really thank you. Um, at least we're doing something different. If you keep doing the same thing and getting the same results, I thank you, at least the template now, that's a start. We're trying something different. So I really appreciate that, Commissioner. And I was thinking it in regards to the OMB. OMB, um, the budget was announced last uh, month. Has the department made any additional budget um, requests from the Office of Management and Budget? budget? Well, and if you have, could you give me one of the requests you put in? Right. From the time we submit, there's all, always ongoing conversations, uh, both about reductions as well as uh, some other new needs. Those conversations are ongoing, and there's nothing uh, I could really share at this time because we're just beginning those conversations now. Okay, that's good to know. And have you ever asked for a line item of playground associates? My colleague, he just asked that um, he need more staff in the parks. Playground Associates, I put in, out of my discretionary funds, I put in just that my parks could stay clean right. every summer. I do concerts out of my own pocket in Brevoort every year. But in my discretion, I still have to put extra money in that we can have people to make sure that our parks stay clean, that it's not a problem, and it's given employment. So have you ever thought about doing an ax in the city for a line item right. of play associate, playground associates? We did associates. last year. We got 500 uh, peak seasonal staff uh, that supplemented our parks in the past. How many hours do they get? Uh, they work a regular work hour. Because um, I do believe a 35 we, hour pass, week. Yeah. we pass it that they stay a little longer than just the I summer. Don't know actually, are they 40 hours? Or 30? They're 40, 40 hours. hours. I'm sorry, correction, they're 40 hours. And with that peak seasonal, we were able to keep some of our comfort stations open longer. Uh, we also supplemented uh, what we call, uh, what happens is that staff has stepped up to pools and beaches, mm -hmm. our, our supervisors, and now we were able to back, backfill, so we kept an even level of staffing in a lot of our parks. Uh, but also, most of the smaller parks, I don't know if you're referring to a larger park or a smaller park, the smaller parks are really uh, cleaned by mobile crews. In terms of fixed posts, those are really for some of the larger parks. 
So with the seasonal staffing, uh, we were able to provide 500, and that was baseline. So they'll be coming in again, and we're working out how they're going to be deployed right now throughout our parks. So they, they are uh, playground associated specific to a park yes. that is staying there. Uh, that is you something said you just did 500 last year was baseline so it's every baseline year. okay that's good could you give me a breakdown of how many you hired we're in the process of hiring now since they're peak seasonal so we're in the process of hiring uh, commissioner Kavanaugh could probably no, tell I'm you right. talking about it in permanent staff because with the playground associates this body had put in legislation that instead of just like wet workers having them just for the summer it should be a path to employment. So I was just wondering, right. have y'all practiced that as of yet? In terms of the job training participants, it is a path. They both the pathway to jobs. Both private as well as uh, public and New York City Parks jobs. Uh, I believe the number. I think we placed about 700, 700. participants in the job training program into jobs. Uh, most of them in the private sector, but about a private sector. But about 130, I think, were hired by the Parks Department directly to fill vacancies within our ranks. That's good. So, at a later date, I would love to see the breakdown of the wet workers. How many have went to? Right. We we discon we don't do the wet workers anymore. Now it's just the job training participants. Okay. So well, we phased job. out the wet. It's just right now the job training participants uh, okay. are the public assistance recipients that we work with. All right. I would love to, I got one more question. Um, since uh, 2016, um, you did summonses, summonses in the park. It's almost like 20,000, it went up. What kind of summonses are summonses that you give in people in the park? That it, it went up so high in, since 2015 to 2016? I don't have the actual breakdowns, but typically we give summonses for enforcing park rules. This is not related to uh, uh, serious crimes per se, uh, but we are on track to probably do about the same this year. But these are just the quality of life and offenses that breaking the park rules, we first educate. Our first goal of our Parks and Force Patrol is to educate the public. If a rule is being broken, we request compliance. If there's non-compliance, then a, a summons is issued. See, and that's where I'm, I can't understand a decrease of 36% when compared to 10,380 summonses was issued during the same period of fiscal 2016. However, the DPR keeps the current place. They might nearly reach nearly 20,000 in 2016, 50, 15 and 16. So I'm saying respectfully, something has changed from 10,384 summonses to 20,000 summonses in the park. Right. Something is crime going that bad in the parks? It's not related. NYPD. I'm trying to see if maybe it was contribute to now. It's no smoking in the park. Right. Could you? Give me NYPD, something. Yes, NYPD uh, are the ones who. But NYPD don't give the summonses. It's the Parks Department. No you, no, you mentioned crime. It says crime going up. NYPD is the one that handles crime. Our PEP officers are the mm -hmm. ones that enforce park rules. Now, we were baseline with 67 additional PEP officers. And so, uh, again, our. Is this the NYPD? Given these summonses or the no. uh, well, well, it, uh, let, let me let me jump in. We, we're we're going to need to move on, unfortunately, Council Member. But we we had spoken about this earlier. I'm and sorry. The, the, sorry the, for the, being, the but I the, would love to know which one. Look, the fact is that park enforcement officers are law enforcement personnel, and they have arrest powers. They, uh, in many cases, respond to life and death emergencies. They also enforce park rules. That's a big part of their portfolio. Um, and we did clarify earlier that uh, it's not just minor infractions that are concerned, but the number of felony um, crimes against uh, persons in the parks are also up year on year. So uh, we, we use that as a context for advocating for an increase in the PEP but officers. Increase some assistance. Yes, but we, we do need to move on only because the commissioner has a limited time and we have other questions and I don't want to lose him. But uh, if you want to stick around for a second round of questions, we'd we'll, we'll be happy for that. And I'm going to cue our colleague, uh, Councilmember Johnson, followed by Councilmember Salamanca. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. 
Good to see you, Commissioner. Good to see you. I always enjoy working with you and your staff, especially your Chief of Staff, Margaret Nelson, and the folks in the Manhattan Borough Commissioner's Office that I get to work with. With that being said, I have some tough questions. I want to preface by being nice. I feel like it's like Groundhog Day. I'm like the guy that steps in the puddle every morning over and over again when it comes to Parks Capital. I feel so frustrated. And I know, Commissioner, that one thing that you have taken very seriously over the last three years, and I think you're very proud of, uh, and I give you credit for, is the change in the Parks Capital process. I've heard you speak about that uh, in this hearing today, but I just want to give you a few examples, and we don't need to go through and talk, because I know it's their individual projects, and each project has a unique situation, but I just want to... I feel like I have one day a year to vent about this. So give me my two minutes to vent, okay? That's, that's what I'm So here, here we for. go. Here we go. So I fund a fence for a garden almost three years ago. It's like $150,000, whatever the number is. A year later, I'm told the fence is actually more expensive. It's about $100,000 more expensive, Jane Street Garden. I said, okay, I'll put in the most expensive fence I've ever heard of in my entire life. George V, the designer, I mean, he builds good fences. I put the extra money in. Three years later, still no fence. I understand procurement, bid issues. Three years, no f tiny garden. That to me says there's something broken. That there's something majorly broken that after three years, a fence, you can't get a fence put in. I'm sold as part of a multi-site contract. I give money towards Jackson Square fountain repairs. Basic, I mean, nothing complicated here. The Conservancy, every six months, coming to me. When's the fountain being upgraded? When's the fountain? Three years, the fountain's not fixed. So I harass your staff because my constituents harass me and saying, you keep telling us it's gonna get done, it doesn't get done. That's very, you know, I've talked to your staff about it, we don't need to go into the situation. It just speaks to me that there is something broken if that's going on. There's really no excuse for it. Okay. Uh, I put money into Downing Street Playground. I put money into Father Fagan Park. I put my, I name a bunch of parks. And then I'm told by the borough commissioner's office, sorry, Father Fagan is, needs more money, and Matthews Palmer needs more money, so we have to take the hundreds of thousands of dollars you put into Downing, and we need to move it to two other parks to cover the cost overruns that are associated. So forget about all that time, money, touring, effort you put into Downing Street out the window because of cost overruns. I'm not trying to beat up on you because, as you said, there are cost overruns which you don't have control over. And if bids don't come in properly, you don't have control over that either. But it's extraordinarily frustrating that you spend time, energy, effort, and this happens. So I'm at the point now where I say to myself, I don't even want to give capital anymore to parks. I just don't want to do it. It's not, it's not worth the frustration on my part to give capital and then have my constituents upset with me and for me to bother your staff members. I feel bad bugging them, honestly. I feel bad calling them up and bugging them. I don't enjoy it. I feel like I'm being a pest. That's my rant on Parks Capital. And I just, I know you've spent an enormous amount of time and you've improved it in many ways, but I just asked that it be improved further. I don't know how that is. You're the expert. I'm very frustrated. I'm grateful, but I'm frustrated. So I had to say that. I share your frustration, and the answer is yes. Uh, we're constantly looking at ways we can improve the process. Uh, and when it, sometimes with procurement, we get surprises where uh, we don't get a successful bid. That could delay things up to six months. But you're correct. 
Uh, we're working now with MOX. Uh, they will be releasing uh, something called Passport, which will allow the whole Vendex process to be online. And we're working with the administration to constantly see other ways we can improve the process. Design, I'm pleased to say, we've now shaved uh, two months off the process on construction, three months off the process. But procurement is one that we're working now at MOX uh, to see how we can uh, improve the process to move things forward. Has Helen Rosenthal with uh, Councilmember Cohen co-sponsored a bill to see if that could also streamline the, uh, the procurement process. And so we continue to look ways of doing it because we all have good relationship with our council members. This is one where I look in their eyes, I know they're uh, disappointed because their constituents are sharing the same concern, and I want those completed as quickly as possible as well. Thank you, Commissioner. So, so in, in the hearing that we held on the capital process uh, about a month ago, we explored in depth this tension between stories you're hearing from the front lines, from council members about projects which are taking three, four, five, six in more years, and, and the, the, the good work that we know you're doing behind the scenes to hammer out efficiencies. And uh, one of the things that emerged is that the main metric you're using to measure your on-time success is only focus on the construction stage. Now, from the perspective of our constituents, and therefore our own perspective, it's very simple. The day the funding is announced is when the clock starts ticking in, tick, ticking in the public mind, and the day that the ribbon is cut is when the clock stops ticking, right? So if that's seven years, and we extracted a little benefit in the construction period of that while also having big delays in procurement and design and even the period of pre-design, pre then it's still a loss for the community. So when you cited a 54-day gain in the timetable of capital projects, were you referring to an overall gain uh, in this process from funding to completion, or were you just looking again at the construction stage? No. We were looking at there are three stages. Uh, the ones that we can influence the most as parks is design. Design, there was a 54, 55 day savings, roughly two months from design. Procurement, we're working very hard, but that's the one we control the least. And construction, there has been on average a three month savings, 99 days. So it's the two months on design, the three months on construction, because I gave a range of anywhere between four to six months, and that is we're able to shave some time off procurement. So that is what now we're seeing from the time I came on board, tracking it from 2014. Uh, I want to drill down on that more in a minute, and Councilmember Johnson has a follow-up and has to leave. I'll, I'll just make the point that there, there, there really are four phases, because there's pre-design, design, procurement, construction, and the public doesn't care what agency has uh, jurisdiction over any phase, and we understand that in some are out of your control. And I know that pre-design has never been part of your calculus, but that is, uh, I think your goal is for that to be a year only, which means in practice it's often longer. So uh, it, it's, it's not a trivial addition to the total timeline. There isn't really a pre-design. Um, when we uh, hold a public meeting, uh, that is when the process starts. But in, in the public's mind, when Councilmember Salamanca or Johnson or Mealy or I secure funding for a park, that's when it's in the press, right? That's when the public becomes aware of it. And if it's 18 months before the first design meeting, you know, that's part of, yeah. that's part of a, the, the delay that we're experiencing, right? Well, last year we got 140 projects. Uh, all cannot start at the same time. It's like 140 plans uh, taken on the runway at once. What we do is we're committed to have those projects within that fiscal year assigned as staff becomes available. So you are correct. There is some time for us to assign it to a staff or a consultant, and that could take, in some cases, nine months uh, or up to a year. Okay. We'll follow up on that in a second. Yes. Back to Councilmember Johnson. Okay. <clears throat> Quickly, I put money in the budget to fill all the tree pits in my district. I can't get a commitment on when that's going to get done. I gave, I gave enough money to fill every empty tree pit in my district. And it would be helpful to understand when the next planting season is so that I could have all those tree pits filled. Who can make that commitment to me of when that will happen? Uh, Council Member, I, I, the, the, the tree planting season actually began just recently. Uh, I can't guarantee you that we will complete them all this spring, but I will guarantee you that every viable tree pit in your district that's funded for planting will be planted by the end of this fall. By the end of this fall, all of them? Yes. 
Manhattan borough office, did you hear that? When I call you and harass you by the end of this Frankly. fall, <laughs> Commissioner Kavanaugh said so. Okay, lastly, the High Line, 7 million annual visitors, one of the biggest tourist attractions in New York City now, uh, almost a decade old at this point, a huge success for the city of New York. Uh, Chair Levine has been a huge supporter and advocate for the park, and I really appreciate his support. The park is now uh, having some capital issues. You know, some of the stuff that was brand new back when it opened now uh, needs help. Uh, they, of course, have raised a ton of money over the years for their own capital expenses. Uh, they've worked with EDC on some projects. Uh, you all have been generous in PEP officers and other ways supportive of them. I really appreciate that. But their capital needs over the next five years are significant. I am allocating over $600,000, which is a lot for me, in capital money to help them with some very unsexy things, uh, but things that are critically important to the maintenance of the park. Is the Parks Department going to put money up and help the High Line uh, because of the significance of the park? Well, I'll first, I serve on the, the board, yes. and uh, I, I'm going to have to have a conversation with both the board and uh, both the CEO, Robert Havid. I'm not familiar about some of the capital needs being asked for, so I'll certainly circle back. Uh, but there is some obligation from the city. It is a New York City park, uh, but I can't say exactly what our capital commitment would be. But we do have responsibility since it's a city park. But I serve on the board, and I know they're looking at uh, funding the last piece um, of the park, the last uh, um, strand, uh, whatever they uh, were. Section to that three, piece. yeah. Yes. Uh, but beyond that, it hasn't been brought to my attention about some of the other uh, capital requests. Great. Well, I'd love to chat with you about that. And then lastly, I want to say your staff has done a phenomenal job on 20th Street Park. You were there to cut the ribbon. The design team uh, has done a great job. The community process, the charrette, the outreach, everything has been really, really, really well done. I am really grateful because that has been a major priority for me, as you know, for the last three years. Um, and, and I think that that project, if it gets done on time, uh, has really spoken to, I think, the amazing work that the Parks Department does in making neighborhoods in New York City feel included in the process clearly communicating with folks about what's happening and what's going to happen. And it's a process that's made me feel really good about your agency and department. And I want to thank you for that. Very welcome. I enjoyed every time I spent there. A very enthusiastic community. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Councilmember Johnson. You know, the, the Bloomberg administration, which was um, really great on investment of capital to create new parks, including the High Line, much to its credit, uh, had a proposition that they would invest in capital, but they would put not a penny in for expenses. This was done in a number of parks, uh, the High Line being one of them. Now they're faced with an onslaught of 7 million users a year. And, boy, that, that is a lot of trampling uh, for a park that's not getting virtually any public support on the expense side, except, I guess, for PEP officers. So uh, I would argue that it's time to open, open the conversation of um, can we help them manage this, this just astoundingly high rate of usage? Uh, otherwise, the park's really going to suffer. It's not good for anybody. Um, all right, we're going to pass it off to my colleague, Councilmember Salamanca from the Bronx. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let's see. He's, yeah, he's got a one-person <laughs> fan club in the back there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, welcome. Was that, was that your wife, Council Member? No, oh, no. Okay. Full disclosure, my wife does work Jackie. for parks, but no, it's not. Um, Commissioner, welcome. Um, I uh, have a few questions. I um, want to talk a little bit about Orchard Beach. Um, Orchard Beach has been ignored for years. Um, you know, it's a Bronx Review era. Uh, this is where families in my council district, they cannot afford to go on vacation, so they go to Orchard Beach. Um, there was a the Bronx delegation put in a request that was the number one request last year, and we got zero dollars. Um, I know that the governor has made a commitment and the mayor has made a commitment. I just want to talk a little bit about what's happening, what's the timeline, when will work begin in Orchard Beach? Well, right now the project is not fully funded. Uh, there's a commitment right now of about 40 million. Uh, the project can cost 45 to 50 million. So I stated earlier uh, that uh, we're going to sit down, take a look, 
to see exactly uh, what work could be done uh, for a lesser amount. We don't want to start scaling it back. Uh, there was a proposal from a consultant about how much it would cost to fully restore it. But right now, uh, with the $10 million uh, from the borough president and the delegation, uh, $20 million from the mayor, and then a commitment for $10 million from the governor gets us to 40. there is still a shortfall. But, but sorry, so, sorry to interrupt, but, but Commissioner, was there not a $10 million commitment from uh, Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty on top of what you cited? That would get us to there is, there is. So that doesn't get us to 50? We're, yeah, just to clarify, we're in conversations with the state and the assembly to kind of clarify the exact details there. I mean, I, I believe there is uh, not as public a commitment as the governor made in terms of his 10 million. There are conversations happening about an additional 10 million that I believe are coming from the assembly, but those details are still being worked out. Okay, but if that, if that 10 million is there, and, and I understood that it is, I think the council member did as well, does that get us to at least the starting line on the renovating the bathhouse? Yes, if it is fully funded for what we anticipate, then the answer is yes. We just cannot con start a project uh, unless it is fully funded. Un understood. Okay, and continue. what's the total cost of the project? About 50 million. 50 million. 50, five zero. For, for the bathhouse. Okay. But the broader grounds, we're talking well over 100. Correct? Correct. But you could start the bathhouse if you had 50 in place. Correct. Okay. All right. So we're eager uh, to get this started. I guess this is an ongoing conversation that we'll have. Um, Barreto Point Park. Uh, when Sandy hit the pier, uh, there was structural damage done to the pier. Many years have gone by. I'm still waiting you know, to open up the pier. When will work begin? What's the status on this pier? Um, I'll have to, I did a site visit and I know that it is in very poor shape with uh, some of the piles. I'll have to get back to you. I'm not sure of the status unless, uh, no. do we have, we'll get, back. we'll get back, right. we'll get back to you on that one. All right. Um, my, my other question, um, you know, Commissioner, I'm very happy in my council district in terms of the, the CPI. There were five parks that were done in part of Community Board 2. When I became council member, I had a bigger district. In Melrose, we're opening up new parks. They're under construction. Um, really satisfied with the work. I know work is being done. Um, but I have concerns about enforcement. Um, you know, for years, even when I was district manager, I felt that the South Bronx was not getting its fair share of PEP officers actually patrolling our parks. Mm -hmm. um, now, with some of these parks under construction, you're bringing new amenities. That means that we're going to get bigger crowds coming to the parks. Uh, there's going to be comfort stations. How many PEP officers are assigned to the Bronx in this uh, fiscal year? Uh, it's, we're funded for 54, but we have right now 38. So you're funded for 54, and you have 38 at the moment. Now, are you hiring new? The, you're hiring, hiring new public officers? And putting, always hiring and putting them through the academy. The answer is yes. All right. And out of the 38, how many are actually working? Because I know that you have officers that are on leave, on maternity leave, out. Where? Yeah. We have in general, of all the staff, seven on leave, but that's among all those that are, that are active. Okay. And so... The summer's coming, and I know that we see less of a presence of PEP officers in our local parks because they're patrolling the beaches. Um, what, what remedy are you going to do so that we can see more of a presence in, in, in the South Bronx? So, to, to be clear, we have the 38, but we're also supplemented by 542 Park Security Service. The majority of those uh, you will see deployed to pools and beaches, so it allows the PEP officers to patrol uh, the various parks um, uh, in the city. So we don't often talk about that. We have 292 and fully staffed on the Parks Enforcement Patrol, but we have 542. Now, they don't have the same powers as a PEP officer. They can't arrest, but still they do uh, provide a presence on the pools and beaches to remind people to follow the park rules. So it doesn't really affect that number because we deploy those to pools and beaches. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, you know, Commissioner, uh, unfortunately in some of my parks um, we have individuals who do not know how to behave you know, in parks, there's a lot of illegal activities. They use the comfort stations for drug use, alcohol use. Um, having more of a presence means a lot uh, to us, especially when, you know, most of our parks have baseball fields and children, you know, we, we want them to, uh, to enjoy their parks and, a safe, and have a safe environment. And PEP officers bring that safe environment just, just to have them there. Um, 
And uh, I mentioned earlier, but we work hand in hand with NYPD. Uh, you can imagine with a force of 255, uh, we do our best to educate the public and help enforce the park rules. But uh, in support of what we do, we work very closely with NYPD to make sure uh, that they patrol as well as we patrol all parks. And I do have an answer for you on a Beretta Point Pier. It's at the controller's office for registration. Uh, so that is a good sign, which means that construction can start very soon. So once his office signs off, how soon will construction begin? Is there? Yeah, about a month. About a month. Yes. About a month from now. All right. And then just finally, just want to give a big shout out to my Bronx Commissioner, Iris Rodriguez. I think that's one of the best decisions that you've made in putting Iris in the Bronx. And if Corey was here, I would tell him, you know, Corey, she could resolve your issues over there in Manhattan as well. All right. Well, thank you very much. Now, that's much more than a one-person fan club. Uh, we're going to go to second round questions, which we have from Council Members Mealy and Cohen. I'm going to ask the sergeants to put us on a three-minute clock for the second round because we are uh, running up against the deadline for the commissioner's time, and I want to make sure that we do not uh, lose him. So, Commissioner Me uh, Council Member Mealy, not a commissioner yet, maybe one day. Uh, you're on, please. Um, I just want to pass. Um, I will speak to them afterwards just to get the numbers of the summonses. We have to see where the up um, increase of all these summonses are coming, so I speak to you afterwards. And I thank you. I'm, I can say I put all the shovels in the ground, cut the ribbons, 90% of my district. I, I say I have to save something for somebody else to do. And so you I, have the Betsy Head Anchor Park. Betsy Head Anchor Park. But my last statement, Betsy Head Anchor Park would be better as a dome. If we, that's the highest density of public housing, and I have asked the mayor previous three, I could say two mayors now, if we really talked about saving lives, if we put a dome in there, we could get the next Olympics individuals right there from Brownsville. And I have, we had started at one point. We have, I had put up 10 million, tried to get the assembly, the Senate, and the state. But I feel if we could do it and um, do the aviator, in Brooklyn, we could do it right there in Brownsville just as well at Betsy Head Park. It's big enough that we could have to save lives in a dome right there at Betsy Head Park. So please, that's my vision. It always been my vision. I hope someone take the fire torch and take it away. But I feel we really need a dome, not just a park there. And thank you, Chairman. Well, thank you, Councilmember Ramili and Councilmember Cohen. Uh, thank you very much. I really just have one thing I just kind of forgot. Uh, on CPI, one of the things I guess I've been a little concerned about is in the 11th Council District, there's been a tradition of the council members funding capital projects in their parks. And I just want you to keep in mind when you're reviewing uh, appropriate spending for CPI, uh, that that should not be like, you know, our district should not be penalized. Community Board 8, Community Board 7 should not be penalized uh, because the council members had had the ability uh, to fund parks in their district. So it's just, it, it's, a, it's a concern of mine that, the, the, that the, again, that we're not missing out on, like I had a, a very good project that I recommended uh, in Kasuth Playground to try to, to, for some help there. And I would hope that that would, again, yeah, the, that the, we, it, it's not. There are several factors, but the main one is the, the 20 year lack of investment. So each year you have another set that's rolling into that 20 year cycle. Uh, but that was the main criteria. We wanted to focus on those parks, and again, it turned out to be 134. That's seen little and no investment in 20 years. Uh, uh, very dense, high poverty levels, and potential for growth. So we use that criteria, but each year you have a certain list that pops up, so I'm sure sooner or later uh, parks in your district may, may surface. But we want to be very fair and use a data-driven approach. Uh, I understand some uh, felt concerned, but for 20 years not to see investment for us was a trigger that we had to do some intervention. Thank you. <laughs> You're I, the chair. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to thank the commissioner. Oh, we're, commissioner, we're going to thank you for your testimony, and we're going to call the next panel. What, hold it. Hold Commissioner, can you hold just one second while we try to figure out? We can ask some questions. Not <laughs> Commissioner, would you mind being patient for just a minute or two? I don't mind. Thank you very much. You've been quite patient already this morning. So.
But since we have them here, no, I'm sorry. Councilman Miller, do you have a question? Okay. I would have stretched it. Man. <laughs> I figured you'd be grilling him for a very long time. Um, thank you all for waiting. Uh, Okay, Commissioner, I know that you're on a tight schedule, so I'll, I'll try and get through uh, some, some additional questions in an expeditious fashion. Um, the Queensway, wonderful project that I cited in my opening statement. What is the status uh, as far as the Parks Department is concerned? Uh, we are certainly having conversations with uh, the Queensway, and I do know that we uh, signed off and let it authorize them to do some early design work. Uh, we are focused uh, because we have such a large system of making our old parks new again, and right now that tends to be our focus. But in the meantime, uh, meeting again with the Queensway team that has a new leader as far as the tr trust for public land. Uh, but in terms of our focus right now is to make sure, like the Anchor Parks Initiative, we want to make those old parks new uh, and focus there. But we're certainly open to having a conversation. Well, I'm with you on supporting our existing parks, but a project like this, it just doesn't come along uh, more than once a generation because of the existence of the abandoned rail line. And usually when we talk about creating new parks, we stumble over the acquisition challenge and the cost of it as we experienced spectacularly with Bushwick Inlet, and I'm very happy it was resolved. But here we have a new park proposal where the entire, every square inch of it uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the acquisition problem is solved. So uh, there's, no, there, there's, there's cost associated with the, the renovation, but not, not the acquisition. So time is not necessarily on our side because it currently is an abandoned property now. With It's probably unsafe. Uh, it's certainly unsightly. Are you, are you concerned about the current state of that, uh, that property at the moment? I haven't had a full view. Uh, I've seen it on paper, so I don't know all. I know it traverses parks and other neighborhoods. Uh, but as I stated, that uh, I'll be meeting with the Queensway team soon. And we did sign a letter that authorized them to get a grant to start the early uh, phases. So I'm eager to see some of the work that they're doing. Uh, I was just stating just for now, uh, we are focusing on making some of those older parks new. But I'm also open to see the Queensway proposal and how it evolved since I last met with them maybe two years ago. All right, well, I look forward to hearing your update after that meeting. Uh, I know that the cost of tree pruning has risen uh, quite significantly, and the impact has meant that you can get to each tree less often. Uh, what is the, the now expected interval between tree prunings for street trees? I'm going to ask Commissioner Cavanaugh to answer that question. Uh, Council Member, we did see for the first time in many years a significant increase in the cost per tree pruning, uh, and it did have a temporary impact on our ability to prune trees. Thankfully, uh, the mayor's office uh, funded that gap between what we, we used to pay and what we're paying now, so we're still on a seven-year cycle, which is, the, which is the good news. I didn't appreciate that, and that is great news indeed. Thank you. Um, <laughs> All right, tree stump removal. This uh, is a, a, a real challenge, in, particularly in the outer boroughs, uh, where the backlog uh, is quite considerable. Uh, what is the current backlog on tree stump removals? Uh, the, the current backlog is about 20,000 stumps. Wow. It's down significantly from what it was just a few years ago, however, and we are, we are making progress. And that is because you, put, you were able to put in a million dollars for... Uh, in last year's budget to reduce the backlog, right? Yes, we had a baseline of uh, $2 million in mayor allocation to which the council added a million dollars, which we appreciated greatly. Uh, however, there is uh, you know, uh, you know, a, a gap between the number of trees we remove every year, the number of stumps we're able to remove with those contract dollars, and the current backlog. Uh, so while we have made significant progress, uh, we would need an additional investment in order to eliminate the backlog and remain current uh, with the stumps that are generated by our tree removal. Program. Okay, so it's not the case that there was a million that you put in last year on top of the baseline amount, which now would be lost? 
I'm sorry. Yes, the council funding is not baselined in the, oh, in so the that upcoming was, budget. Uh, understood. So if I were to call today to inform you of a tree stump that needed to be removed, what's the expected delay before it's actually removed? Uh, it, it, it's difficult to say because of a, a variety of factors. Number one being uh, having a, a qualified contractor in place to remove them. There is always some amount of time in the, the bidding and procurement and, and award could, process. Could you even estimate, is it a year, is it, six, is it 18 months, uh, is it more, heaven forbid? Uh, it, it would probably be uh, between a year and 18 months, I would say, would be a, a, a good estimate for removing every, if we were fully funded, to removing every stump after a tree was removed. Okay, yes. well, that, that's, that's far too long, and we, we will be pushing uh, in the budget negotiations to make sure that we can reduce the backlog. Uh, and therefore reduce the delay uh, for the benefit of our, our colleagues in the outer boroughs, and I gather in Brownsville this is perhaps an issue as well. Um, am I correct that there are no, there's, there's no additional round of parks uh, equity at community parks initiative funding? Is that correct? Uh, have you run through allocating all the parks that you can under the current funding? Under the current one, the next round will be announced as 11 more sites. Those will be announced this fall, and I believe that will conclude the, uh, the funds that we have allocated from the initial 318 million. So at that point, the door is closed uh, for, unless you get additional money for adopting new parks into the Correct. program. Correct. When you had designed it originally, you did an inventory, and I believe that you identified 200 parks or more that uh, that qualified based on lack of investment? There were 215 fact? parcels, and when we did our analysis, some of these weren't, they were park assets, but what you would call a playground per se, and that list went down from 215 to 134. Uh, the 67 was part of that initial program, and that's now what is, uh, we're moving forward with the 67. Okay, understood. Um, I just had one follow-up question from my staff vis-a-vis -vis stump removal, which is, if, what would it cost to fully fund that program? If, if resources were not the constraint anymore, are we talking two million more, three million? What is the, what's the shortfall there? Uh, there are two components to it. To eliminate the backlog would cost about seven and a half million dollars just for the oh, That's a one-shot deal, right. Shot. And then it would take approximately uh, four and a half million dollars in total uh, to keep current with the stumps that are generated annually through our removal program. Yep. Okay. We have a lot of people waiting to testify, so uh, we'll wrap it up there. And I thank you very, very much for your attention over the last two and a half hours. Thank you. And uh, our first panel uh, will consist of Heather Lubov from the City Parks Foundation, Lynn Kelly from New Yorkers for Parks. Okay. As well as Aziz Dekem from the New York City Community Garden Coalition. And those, that's going to be our first panel, if you all could make your way up. And, and sergeants, because sergeants, because we have a very, very thick stack of people who want to testify, we're going to—I'm going to ask you to use a two-minute clock here. And uh, Heather, Heather, and Lynn, if you're in place, uh, please, Heather, why don't you kick us off? Okay. Thank you, Chairman Levine and members of the committee. I'm Heather Lubov. I'm the executive director of City Parks Foundation. We are the only independent nonprofit organization with a mission to offer programs in public parks throughout the city. And our goal is to help transform parks into vibrant community centers. We work in every council district. We bring sports, arts, education, and community development programs to more than 350 parks, recreation centers, and schools across the city. And we reach 425,000 people every year. This year, thanks to the council's leadership expense funding, we offer track and field instruction in 12 parks to nearly 1,700 kids bringing high-quality lessons into neighborhoods where few organized athletic activities exist. 
Leadership funds also allowed us to connect more than 2,400 students to experiential learning in parks, gardens, forests, and coastal areas to nurture a lifelong relationship between young people and the environment. I also want to thank uh, council members for providing discretionary funding this year for City Parks Foundation programmings in their districts and the council for providing $2.6 million in a capital appropriation for summer stage in Central Park, which is currently in the design phase and should begin next summer. The Council's Parks Equity Initiative and the NYC Parks Community Parks Initiative has allowed us to grow Partnerships for Parks, which you heard was the public-private program that we jointly manage with NYC Parks. Partnerships has supported and championed a growing network of volunteer groups caring for and advocating for neighborhood parks. In the past three years, with this new funding, we've been able to support 37% more Friends of groups citywide. We've tripled the number of community visioning consultations and skill building workshops, and we've increased the number of It's My Park service projects by more than 60%. These groups are comprised of volunteers who have a myriad of work and family obligations, but still find the time to give back and improve their communities. The Council's Parks Equity Initiative funding is key to making sure that these programs are successful and that their work is sustainable in the long term. We're, proudly, we're proud to directly address the administration's strong focus on equity, and we support NYC's park, NYC Park's emphasis on community parks and serving underserved communities. We're committed to delivering the most responsive service, and so with the recent growth in Partnerships for Parks, we've made improvements that include how we identify and build new groups and coalitions in the neediest parks, and also how we provide more advanced support to our longer-term groups. But at the most basic level, the more staff we have on the ground, the more groups we'll be able to serve. To that end, we would strongly support adding new outreach coordinators, allowing us to continue to build new groups every year, while supporting the growing number of existing groups. Uh, our programs are free and are synchronized with New York City Parks, but City Parks Foundation is a nonprofit organization, and we need the Council's assistant, assistance to continue supporting the vision for an equitable park system. Thank you for hearing my testimony, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Just to clarify, the number of outreach workers you currently have is at? 16. 16. Okay, so each worker has how many parks under their portfolio? It's approximately 45 per outreach coordinator. That seems like an extremely heavy load, and I'm guessing they have each two or three community boards as well. Yes. That's a lot of territory for one person to cover. It is a lot of territory. And it probably means they don't show up at any one park very often. I think they do their best working nights and weekends and around the clock. So they are serving all those groups as best as they can, but we, 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 we know strongly they're, advocate for more outreach coordinators. But we know they're super committed. So if you were to have another 10 outreach coordinators, uh, what would that do to your impact? To give you a sense, right now we're in about 30% of parks around the city, so another 10 would be another 30 to 35 parks per person at minimum, so you can do the math on that. That would have a huge impact on our ability to build friends groups around the city. So 10 additional outreach workers might translate into 300 parks that you could reach that you're not currently reaching. Yes. That's, that's really significant and I think justifies why we're pushing for this funding in the budget. So. Thank, thank you for the amazing work that City Parks Foundation does. You've been a really strong partner for the City Council, and the, you've helped make the Community Parks Initiative, the Parks Equity Initiative, uh, extremely popular among my colleagues. So we thank you for that. Okay, Lynn. Good afternoon. I'm Lynn Kelly, Executive Director of New Yorkers for Parks. Thank you for inviting us to testify today on the budget. Um, Parks, as you know, has continued to make meaningful investments throughout the city, but we really feel strongly that there's more work still to do. We understand the administration's uh, rather conservative approach in this year's budget due to pending cuts from Washington, and as you rightfully pointed out, Council Member, um, the cuts on the CDBG program is going to have devastating effects on Green Thumb, unfortunately. And so we would urge the Council and the administration to consider um, funding the $1 million that could be lost as a result of these cuts. One of uh, the most critical additions we believe needs to be baselined in the city's budget is the $9.6 million to retain the 100 city park workers and 50 gardeners throughout the city. Again, as you rightly pointed out, this is our third time testifying to restore and have this money there. 
and it's simply not tenable for have the council to continue to put this money in, but these are real jobs for real New Yorkers, and we hope that they will continue and remain. Um, essentially, we see those as, as an infrastructure, an investment in the infrastructure of the people of the park system. And parks has gone to great uh, extent, as you've heard today, through the capital process to invest in its infrastructure of the parks itself. But you need an equal investment in the infrastructure of the people that run the parks. Along with those lines, I'd like to actually talk a little bit about partnership for parks. Um, a budget allocation of just $1 million, council member, would allow for these 10 million outreach coordinators, five new program assistants. I just attended roughly all of our five borough meetings that we've had on parks and heard time and time and again from friends groups and parks advocates that the folks that work for Partnership for Parks are essentially the lifeline, the bloodline to their communities and to their park system. And right now, the, the lift that these outreach coordinators has is simply untenable. So we would ask that the council and the administration really push to have that money for the increasing in staff. We'd also like to see an allocation in this year's budget of $3 million to allow for 50 new urban park rangers. Um, many of the Parks Department staff that you see here today um, were urban park rangers, started their careers in public service as park rangers, as those green ambassadors in the community. They also provide another set of eyes in parks. As we've heard today, there's been a lot of uh, talk about crime in parks, and we think that would help to go a long way to have an increase in rangers. On the capital budget, we're pleased to note the administration's commitment to infrastructure improvements, um, retaining walls, comfort stations, HVAC, all the things that the public might not see as sexy, but is so important to the lifeline of these parks and for the ongoing maintenance of these parks. And we're pleased to see the continued allocation, uh, or new allocation of $82 million committed towards new street tree planting citywide. Our tree canopy is really important to the city's public health, um, and we also support the ongoing maintenance through an expense commitment of $2.7 million. Um, before I end my testimony today, um, I would agree with you that now is the time to really think creatively and boldly about our park system, um, not to be reactionary to Washington, but rather be proactive in what we're doing. And we uh, support projects such as BQ Green, Queensway, Daylighting of Tibbetts Brooks because of their vision, much in the way we support Community Parks Initiative, Parks Without Borders, and Anchor Parks. Um, now is the time to really be the leader uh, for this nation and the park system and to really send the message back to Washington that it's not acceptable to make these cuts to what we consider critical urban infrastructure in New York City. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And your point on, on the imperative now that we lead locally at a time when the help's not coming from Washington, uh, I, I want to wholeheartedly endorse. I, don't, I think we need to do more than just play defense. We need to play offense, and that means scoring wins for public space in this city, uh, whatever's coming out of Washington. And the projects you laid out would be a very powerful way to do that. So thank you for your continued advocacy uh, for the park system. Uh, you're off to a great start in your new role. Thank you both very much. All right, our next panel will be uh, Peter Stein from uh, Local 508 of DC 37, Joe Puglio from Local 983, also DC 37, and Dilsey Ben, Local 1505. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, City Council, Good afternoon. Chair, and Good afternoon. Council Members. <clears throat> my, <clears throat> excuse me. my name is Joe Puglio. I'm President of Local 983. I represent a number of uh, parks titles. I represent the Urban Park Rangers, uh, better known uh, within the uh, PEP officers within that, within that title, uh, the Assistant, um, excuse me, the Associate Park Workers and uh, the city seasonal aids. Um, I'd like to begin by stating that crime has arisen in parks. Uh, if you look at the CompStat reports from the third quarter of 2015 to 2016, it went from 391 in, in 15 
to 495. That's over a third, you know, uh, percentage spike. If it were in uh, any, any precinct, I, I probably think that there would be a serious uproar. Um, New York City parks are sanctuaries for most people. This is where our seniors, our children, they go to these places to seek refuge from the city. They should not be treated at the same level as being at Times Square or riding the R train at 2 in the morning. Uh, when, when I hear people say, well, it's not that bad, it is bad, and it's getting worse. You know, um, we need more parks enforcement officers. Uh, they do the job best in New York City parks. Uh, NYPD does a great job out in the streets. Almost 5% decline from last year to this year in overall park crimes. Uh, the reason why they haven't matched the parks when it comes to uh, lowering the crime stats is because we don't have enough parks enforcement officers. You know, we need about 200 uh, by the Parks Department estimates. That will be about $11.9 million. Uh, last year, we did not receive any funding from City Council when it came to uh, parks enforcement. We did receive some from the Mayor's office. But then again, you know, the job, the job is not yet over. We need, we need more presence in, in our parks. Uh, people need to be, uh, feel safe in our parks. And, uh, you know, time and time again, it has proven that where you have PEP officers, you have a reduction in crime. Uh, we'd also like to see included in that 200 at the agency's discretion, because I heard mention of urban park rangers. Well, our PEP officers come from the title of urban park rangers, but we also have ones that do dedicated service to stewardship. Uh, they um, give out tour guides. They do mostly educational uh, parts, parts of uh, the job description. Uh, we encourage City Council and the Parks Department to hire more of them. There is only 35, 35 citywide, you know. Um, these are the people who probably will do the most in combating crime for the future because they reach out to the children. They explain to them the essentials of why it is important to, to not, you know, uh, destroy our parks, why, why the ecosystem is so, is so, is so fragile. So with, um, without them, you know, uh, it's just going to be crime and punishment, you know, for, the, for our future to come. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Mr. Puglio, for your advocacy for these uh, incredibly important workers. And as you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree that we need to increase the ranks both of PAP officers and urban park rangers, uh, really embarrassingly few of each category right now, and we can do much better. So thank you, sir. All right, Ms. Thank Benn. you. Good, good afternoon, Chairman Levine and fellow Parks Committee members. My name is Dilsey Ben. I'm the president of Local 1505, representing the city park workers. I have members in DOT, Sanitation, Parks, and DEP. All right. My members work in all five boroughs conducting maintenance in all city parks. I'm, I'm, and my people are in charge of all the maintenance operations in all the boroughs. I want to first start out by thanking the council for funding my people, the city park workers, in 2017 for the parks department. The funding was used to maintain city-funded lines for 100 city park workers and 50 gardeners. Parks has over 39,000 acres of land, meaning that one gardener is responsible for maintaining an average of 254 acres of park land. The Department of Parks and Recreation is woefully unfunded, and we request your support in making our communities and those underserved parks in our communities beautiful. Since the, as, since the fiscal budget year funding has been baseline for, um, baseline for 2018, I'm urging the council to restore the increase in the funding. If this funding is not restored, there will not be enough workers in the city, in, in the city park worker and gardener titles to perform the duties as stated above. Therefore, the maintenance and upkeep of the parks will suffer, leading to um, blight and, and neighborhood decay. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, as we approach the start of the spring season and the next several weeks, there's a lot of work to be done to prepare for the summer. The pools are opening. And I get additional lines during the summer. 
But without these 150 lines, um, we don't, our maintenance will be down. Counts are down, the parks are not safe. My people also have saved rapes, murders. I'm quite sure my people have been awarded for stopping crimes in the parks. My people also do the late lockup in the parks at nights. They open up the parks and they lock the parks up at night. Right? My maintenance crew, um, like I said, at harms, I be put in harm's way every day. And like I said, without these 150 lines, um, the parks are going to suffer. Okay? I want to thank you for taking the time to hear out um, what I had to say, Pulio had to say when it came to the maintenance of the park workers. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I wanted to know if you had any questions for me. Well, thank you, uh, Madam President, for advocacy on these behalf of this incredibly important workforce, workforce, which is critical to keeping our parks healthy and inviting. And as you point out, far too often they're involved in difficult incidents that require them to intervene, often putting their own safety at risk. And we've honored a few of your members who have acted heroically to protect people in the park. But I want to just clarify a statistic. You said that the, on average, each gardener has to care for 254 acres system-wide? Yes, because they don't have enough gardeners in the parks that, department to cover all the land. That, we that, have 39,000 39, acres. And, and how many total gardeners do we have? I don't know a total number. Susan might know a number. Do you have a total number, Susan? I think it's 200. 200. It's, yeah, it's about 200 and something um, in total between the gardeners and the assistant gardeners. It's not a lot of gardeners. So when, when, when you put it in perspective, to lose 50 gardeners is a huge chunk of the existing workforce. Yes. I mean, that, that, that is a quarter, uh, roughly, of the existing workforce. So yes. imagine one quarter left gardening work, one quarter less in every park, and you get a picture of the impact that will be felt uh, all over the city. And, of course, the maintenance workers uh, where the proposed cut is even larger, of 100, uh, just do such important work, difficult work, by the way, uh, but they really are the heart of the operation. The maintenance uh, operations. And at the end of the day, if you don't have men and women out there in the field doing the heavy lifting in cold weather and hot weather, uh, then the parks are going to suffer. Yes. And I, I repeat the irony of the fact that these workers have been deployed into what is really a pet project of the mayor, which is the CPI parks. And we, we support that program. But so these are clearly core to the mission of the department. And it's really deeply unfortunate that for the third year in a row, we now have to fight just to keep our, our existing staffing levels. Again. We should be fighting to increase the ranks of gardeners and, and maintenance workers and, of course, PEP officers and others. And instead, uh, we're back in the trenches just trying to keep these uh, men and women on the job. And let's make this real. If we don't succeed on June 30th, all of them are getting laid off. All of them are getting laid off. And like I said, I would love to have them on a permanent basis, but I haven't been that lucky. So every year we come back in here and we have to fight again. And like I said, I want to thank the city council for backing me. Every year that we came back in here, um, my people have been called back, and I well, want to thank we, you for that. We, we, we value working with you. We want to baseline these workers, but until that happens, we're going to fight to get them into the budget this year. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Pulio. Thank, thank you to you. both of you. Thank okay. you. All right. Have Bye -bye. Good afternoon. Next up, we have Pamela Pettyjohn from the Coney Island Beautification Project. Dan Cohen, my friend from the Anibal Aviles Playground. Nora McCauley from Love Our Pool. And also Lee Levine from Love Our Pool. And I, sh I should clarify that Love Our Pool is uh, connected to Brooklyn Bridge Park. Ms. Pettyjohn, would you like to kick us off? Yes. Good afternoon. I'm Pamela Pettyjohn. Could you make sure your mic is on, please? Okay, is that better? 
Good. Okay, great. I'm Pamela Pettyjohn, president of Coney Island Beautification Project, a volunteer community group which works closely with Partnership for Parks. Our members have a passion for assisting in the beautification and upkeep of our public spaces. Many New Yorkers are more than eager to donate their time, energy, expertise in helping in weeding, planting, painting, and doing whatever it takes to maintain the aesthetics of, and diverse usage of our parks grounds. During our tenure working with Partnership for Parks, we have become aware of the thousands of hands needed to preserve our parks and public spaces. Just look around. You'll be amazed at the tremendous amount of accomplishments by, that, that are vol by volunteers every year throughout the vast acreage in each of the five boroughs. From our very first event, the role of Partnership for Parks was immeasurable. Their contribution was tandem to a successful community affair. From our initial introduction, Partnership for Parks supported us by providing in-depth workshops such as how to work with parks and elected officials. Hello, we're all here. <laughs> Time management, networking with other park leaders, how to apply for a 501c3, et cetera. Partnership for Parks also connected us to financial resources, example, applying for grants and in-kind services. It's my park day, a Fort Coney Island beautification project to organize approximately 10 Coney Island area schools, 12 community groups, neighborhood businesses, and several elected officials. Uh, Mr. Traeger is one of them if he was here today. And cleaning and greening our 21 blocks of commercial corridor. How grateful was the group to, to Partnership for Parks for all its assistance. Partnership for Parks, without a doubt, and amplified city resources multiplied several times by factors of itself. For each partnership of parks workers supported by the city, there is a product gain and numerous non-paid volunteers. Community engagement and pride and public is the non-monetary byproduct of partnership for parks. Please tally the value of partnership for parks programs and budget in your worthy worthy discretionary fund budget line. I urge the City Council to please double the contribution to Partnership for Parks to fill the empty positions of outreach coordinators so that more parks and communities can benefit from these wonderful programs. All right, thank you, Ms. Petty John, and Councilmember Traeger was here before, and I know he loves your work, and we appreciate your testimony on the great work of Partnership for Parks. Uh, it's good to hear a real life example of their impact, uh, and I strongly support increasing the budget, particularly for outreach workers. Uh, who is your outreach worker? Um, uh, Hannah Basio and Ted Enoch. But can I just go off to sure, for briefly, one second? Yes. Um, I was listening to all, everyone and, and everyone's concerns, but some of these, uh, I didn't get a chance to list the, some of the events that we have in Coney Island, but as far as crime and everything is concerned, we have uh, annual events for the explorers, the uh, law enforcement explorers. So we have explorers from the police department, um, Homeland Security, Amtrak, FBI, all come out to the parks and celebrate together. We have the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts, we have these environmental educational programs. With all these programs, a Partnership for Parks has helped us put these programs to together, not only for the community, but for South Brooklyn and even the, the schools. This cuts down on a lot of crime. It involves the people in the parks and, and, other, and, and you know, keeps people involved in all of these community events. And it, it helps immensely. Without it, I don't know. Thank, what thank you. We, we appreciate that and appreciate you speaking out today. And thank you for all you do for that wonderful park. Uh, Dan Cohen, please. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Um, I am Daniel Marks Cohen, president of Friends of Annabella Villas Playground, Amigos de Parque de Annabella Villas, which is on West 108th Street between Amsterdam and Columbus Avenue in Manhattan Valley, uh, Manhattan Valley neighborhood of the Upper West Side, ably represented in the City Council by the astonishing City Councilman Mark Levine. I am testifying to the relationship of the You get friends. extra money for that. Yeah. Woo. Thank you very much. So, um, I'm testifying to the relationship of the Friends of Annabella Villas Playground to the Parks Department, Partnership for Parks, and City Parks Foundation. I want to state right up front that we would not exist without the generous and sustained support of Partnership for Parks and the City Parks Foundation. 
The playground honors, honors the memory of Ana Balabiles, a gifted athlete who attended nearby junior high school 54, where he was captain of the basketball and track teams. He was raised on West 109th Street. Aviles belonged to a local Catholic youth organization and participated in other organized athletic programs in the neighborhood. He left school to enlist in the United States Marine Corps and was killed in the Vietnam War. His brief life ended on March 5, 1966, when he was killed in action. He died a month away from his 20th birthday. The park is a fitting memorial for Corporal Aviles, who played in the neighborhood as a child and whose name graces a refuge for today's children. I founded the Friends of Annabelle Aviles Playground in July 2015. It is an all-volunteer organization. The group exists to support the playground, one of the few Upper Manhattan playgrounds with sufficient shade to protect children from sun in the hot summer months. Virtually all of the neighborhood playgrounds in my community are difficult for children to use by June, as the direct exposure of the sun and the metal playground equipment makes it too hot to touch, but not on a Bella Vilas. Once it gets warm enough to go outside, my almost five-year-old son is there almost every day. When we happened upon the park three years ago, we noted that it was spacious but underutilized and a bit run down as it had not seen a significant investment since the Dinkins administration almost 25 years ago. It is with the help of Partnership for Parks and the City Parks Foundation led to our creating the Friends of Annabella Vilas Playground. From there, things moved swiftly. By December 2015, we had succeeded in persuading the Parks Department to install a new child safety fence to prevent children and toys from rolling out onto the street. And several months later, in February 2016, we won a small grant from the City Parks Foundation that enabled us to hold a successful It's My Park Day a few months later in April. Over 100 people attended, including Borough President Gail Brewer. Shortly thereafter, City Parks Foundation recommended that the Friends of Annabella Vilas be featured in the City Parks Foundation's Capacity Fund Grant sponsor, TD Banks, Rooted in New York campaign, which last summer featured a local park volunteer and board member, Bo Morris Grady. He looked fabulous, by the way. More recently, in October, Annabella Vila's playground was repainted through the Parks Department Community Parks Initiative. In December, we participated in New Yorkers for Parks' Daffodil Project and planted 250 bulbs in the gardening area of the playground with the help of 20 children and parents from a local preschool. Our next It's My Park Day project is coming up this spring, and we expect it to be even bigger and better than last year. But we are not done yet. We have secured a commitment from a local nonprofit to construct a public bathroom on their property but accessible to the playground should they succeed in their ULERP application for affordable housing to be constructed next door. And, and, and sorry, if you can, if you can uh, Last sentence. We have, yeah. we have ambitions for new playground equipment. Much has, done, much has been done and much remains to be, to be done. The Parks Department and Partnership for Parks and City Parks Foundation will help us get there. We could not have done it without them, and we are immensely grateful for their support. Well, thank you, Dan, for working on behalf of this jewel of a park. You've really done amazing things in building this coalition, and uh, we're grateful for your service. And again, it's good to hear about a real-life testimony on the importance of Partnership for Parks, uh, to have two examples from different parts of the city uh, really makes the case better than I could. <laughs> so thank you for being here and for your great work on behalf of the playground. Thank you. All right, please. Um, <clears throat> Hi, City Council members, and thank you for holding this hearing today. Um, my name is Nora McCauley, and I'm from a small volunteer organization with many members <laughs> um, called Love Our Pool, and we, rep we represent um, the, the users, the enthusiastic um, supporters of the pool in Brooklyn Bridge Park. And our, our, our objective is to keep a pool in Brooklyn Bridge, Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, and we have an interesting moment right now. Um, I realize this is the, one of the first times that we've uh, talked about pools today at all. Um, the situation in Brooklyn Bridge Park is that there is a small pool um, which is well loved and used not just by every um, by constituents from every city council district in Brooklyn because we did a survey last summer and had a petition, but also by people from um, uh, city council districts in every other borough and of course the many uh, visitors from out of state and even out of country that come to Brooklyn Bridge Park. We were very pleased at the beginning of today's hearing to hear Brooklyn Bridge Park listed with Central Park and the High Line as, uh, as some of the, the top park attractions in the city. That was very gratifying. Um, um, the, the park corporation with whom we've met um, is on track to pull out the little pool that's currently there because in their vision, um, they have a vision for a much larger, more dramatic pool, um, probably a floating pool to go into the water. 
and um, this is a very large and complicated project. As um, I'm sure everybody is aware, Brooklyn Bridge Park is not, just a, is not just a city park, although it's used and loved and treated like a city park, but the funding is, is complex, and there's also there's state park land, um, so there's state money, and there's um, <clears throat> a, a private corporation that does money with real estate there. So the potential is there for money to be raised, but at our meeting we have heard um, a price tag of between 10 and 20 million dollars for a pool. So that's, that's, a, that's staggering actually, it's very substantial. Um, what we are hoping, and uh, my colleague Lee may speak to this as well, what we're hoping to uh, put forward to the city council is there's, um, there's ample opportunity for matching funds, I think, but we would love, um, and the, the Conservancy and the corporation in Brooklyn Bridge Park as well, would love to um, be able to speak to the city council for a commitment that um, could then be matched by additional funders because this is a- All right, so, so, sorry to jump in only because I know that Lee wants to speak yeah. and we're, we're super short on time. So, so, so my, my, my long lost cousin, Lee Levine, yes, please. Yes, I was gonna say, uh, I was gonna attest to that, thank you. Uh, let me just quickly flesh out some numbers. Um, so uh, in the survey that was done for the little pop-up pool that exists right now, uh, besides having a thousand petition signers, um, we serve 31 different zip codes and 82% uh, of the users of Brooklyn Bridge Park's pop-up pool do not come from the neighborhood. Uh, so we come from, we deal with underserved communities. Um, so uh, Council Member Traeger and Council Member Mealy have a robust constituency that use our pool. Recently, uh, Douglas DeGraw pool has had some environmental uh, upgrade needs that are about to come to fruition in the next two years. So that pool is taken out. That's an important piece of the pool for our area and for our constituents. And to juxtapose what we're dealing with, public parkland has been used by the one hotel that's just opened in Brooklyn Bridge Park. And now we've just heard that Governor's Island is going to put in a day spa on public parkland. And so to juxtapose these very privileged and luxurious options for pools with our you know, very meager needs to serve the community, it's critical. So we're asking uh, the council to help us advocate with the mayor to get the necessary funding. Thank you. All right, well, I appreciate that, and we'll be checking in with your local council member on this topic as well. But thank you for coming out and for your advocacy for these important resources. Thank you, panel. We have to move on. I'm sorry, we have so many people who still want to testify. We have next uh, Ziz Dekhan from New York City Community Gardens Coalition, Ed Janoff from Madison Square Park Conservancy, and Marie Winfield from Community Board 11. And uh, as you're making the way to the table, I'll, I'll remind folks that uh, Despite the low head count currently at the table up here, uh, everything you say is being entered into the record. It's being live streamed now on the web uh, and uh, will be transcribed so that uh, what you say does matter. And we're glad you're here to speak up. And Aziza, I will pass it to you first. Sure. Thank you for having me uh, be here today. Could you make, either speak into the mic and make sure it's on? And, and oh, it's. We, we, you're good. Yep. Good. Uh, my name is Aziz Dekhan. I'm the executive director of the New York City Community Garden Coalition. Um, I thank everybody for allowing me to give a few seconds here to talk about the importance of this budget. Um, there are 600 community gardens in New York City. It's about 100 acres of land. Um, we continually f uh, work to make them better. They're community pieces. They're called community gardens because they are shared by everybody in the community. Um, we're very proud of the work that we're doing in those community gardens. A lot of it is the sweat equity of gardeners, but a lot of it has to do with being able to get the support of Green Thumb to help us get resources and materials into those gardens. And we would be neglect not to say that. And we, you know, oftentimes we're community gardeners and we think we do everything on our own. But we're really aware that, that we need Green Thumb to help us and continue to support us. And as an advocate for community gardens within the city agencies, it's really important to keep this budget and to keep 
funding it and expanding on it. And I know, Councilman, you've done quite a bit to help us do that, and we really appreciate the work that you've done to support community gardens. Um, and we continue to hope that this new assault from the federal level um, on community gardens and on the Parks Department in general um, can be stopped. And um, I'm a firm believer in, in the people power of us and working together through agencies and through government and through, again, the sweat equity of people. So we're not going to give up on this. Um, we know that you're not. Um, you've been really supportive. Again, um, and I'll stop because I know I have two other colleagues here who want to speak, but Green Thumb is, is a vital piece of what we do in community gardens. We're on park land, essentially. And um, our, my, my organization, the New York City Community Garden Coalition, our goal is to promote, promote, preserve, and create more community gardens. And we can't do that without the, the work and the, the backing of different organizations and different agencies in the city. So whatever we can do, we will do to make sure that this, these budget cuts don't affect us. Um, don't affect Green Thumb, and don't affect the city in general. I mean, it's not just community gardens. Uh, it's, it's Meals on Wheels. It's everything that we believe in. It's everything the community is about. So that's what we're going to try to do, and we thank you for giving Th us the Thank moment. you, Aziz. What you've done in leading the coalition and building it is just incredible and so important, and even more importantly, what the gardeners are doing, thousands of them in these 600 properties. It's just, it's just making our city a better place and helping our environment and our physical health and so much more. And as you point out, these gardeners don't generally ask for a lot of help. Sometimes all they want is for uh, us to get out of the way. But there are some very important targeted supports which Green Thumb has done, which has made Green Thumb essential. In, in some cases, it's resources. In some cases, it's technical support. It's also connecting gardeners to each other across neighborhoods in the city. And it would just be a body blow to our community gardens if that work stopped. And it's why I've joined you in shining a light on this threat so that it doesn't happen without us fighting back hard. And I'm definitely committed to standing with you in that fight. Thank you. So, thank you, Aziz. Yes, please. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Levine and members of the City Council Parks Committee. My name is Ed Janoff. I'm the Director of External Affairs for Madison Square Park Conservancy in Manhattan. Um, we're the nonprofit organization which is responsible for uh, maintaining that park at 23rd Street and Broadway. Uh, I'm testifying today to ask the Council to allocate funding in the FY18 capital budget to improving a very important monument in Madison Square Park, uh, which is the Eternal Light Flagstaff. Uh, the Eternal Light Flagstaff is a monument which was dedicated in 1923 to the victorious military forces of World War I. Uh, today the Flagstaff is the starting place of New York City's annual Veterans Day Parade, uh, where wreaths are laid in, in an important ceremony paying homage to, to all those who have made the sacrifice defending our freedom. Um, the Veterans Day Parade draws New Yorkers from all boroughs, and this monument is a very important art space for the local veterans community, uh, which encompasses New Yorkers of every background. Uh, this location has historic significance as a starting point for parade units returning home from World War I, including marches for the Fighting 69th, complies largely of Irish Americans, uh, the 77th Division, led by Chinese American Color Sergeant Sing Kao Ki, and the famed African American 369th Infantry Regiment. Um, and in fact, some historians point to that parade for the 369th as the start of the, uh, the Harlem Renaissance. Um, Unfortunately, over the many decades since the monument was erected, its frontage along Fifth Avenue has become blocked and crowded by, by park fencing and shrouded with overgrowth, which is really hiding it from public view and creates a challenging bottleneck for the parade ceremony. Um, so in response, Madison Square Park Conservancy, in partnership with the United War Veterans Council, is proposing that that monument be opened up to Fifth Avenue to make a prominent new entrance plaza for the park at West 24th Street, uh, complete with paving and benches and landscaping and uh, event infrastructure for the Veterans Day Parade. Um, this grand new entrance plaza would be well aligned with a new direct pedestrian crossing of Fifth Avenue at West 24th Street, fulfilling DOT Vision Zero Safety objectives and NYC Parks, Parks Without Borders design principles. Uh, three sentences. The estimated cost of the project is $2 million. Uh, the Conservancy has uh, committed to raising at least 25% of that privately, and we're almost uh, all the way there, thanks to a great commitment from New York Life Insurance Company of $400,000. 
Um, so we're asking the council for a million dollars in capital funding for this project in FY18 to make it possible to renovate the monument in time for the important and highly visible upcoming international centennials of the end of World War I in 2018 and the first Veterans Day Parade in 2019. Thank you. And you're hoping that this capital project would be completed by 2018? or funded by 2018? We can phase it. You might not have been here for the earlier part of the hearing. Yeah, we, can, we, can, uh, we believe we can build it privately and do half of it uh, in time for 18 and the other half in time for 19. Okay, well, it's, it's an incredibly worthy project, one that I've heard a fair amount from other sources, and I know that our colleague who chairs the Veterans Affairs Committee, Councilmember Eric Ulrich, who was here in the hearing earlier, is uh, involved and very supportive. And so we, we appreciate you speaking out to get that on the record here and we look forward to, to coordinating with you and the Conservancy uh, throughout the budget process. Thank you. You got it. Okay, is it Ms. Winfield? Thank you. Good sure. afternoon. Um, my name is Marie Winfield. I'm testifying on behalf of Community Board 11 in Manhattan, which is East Harlem, as the Vice Chair of the Environment, Open Space, and Parks Committee. Um, since East Harlem has been slated for rezoning under the mayor's housing plan, we ha obviously have serious concerns about our built environment, open space, and parks portfolio. Um, we are a, a community parks initiative zone, um, and we remain a neighborhood where our parks, playgrounds, and waterfront areas serve, um, um, haven't seen the needed investment to, um, to accommodate our existing community, much less an eventual upzoning. Um, our parks and playgrounds serve very vulnerable populations. Um, our students in city schools were in East Harlem. We have sizable numbers of homeless families, estimated at over 2,000 children, um, the largest percentage at 40% at uh, PS38 on East 103rd Street. And we certainly have a moral obligation to ensure that there are spaces in our communities where children can be children, experience play and a sense of childhood at safe rehabilitated spaces. And it's certainly not an equitable framework to suggest that volunteer work should make up cuts in staffing by the Parks Department in our most vulnerable communities. Um, our longstanding budget priorities reflect these concerns, like um, renovating the East River Esplanade, and we recommend a comprehensive plan for funding these priorities in this budget cycle, um, which is reflected in our, uh, in our um, budget response. Um, there are several things that we would like to point out, namely that we would like to see increase in DPR staffing and PEP officers to improve upkeep, main maintenance, and safety. Um, Poor Richard's playground rehabilitation, um, rehabilitation of the field turf at Eugene McCabe Field, as well as increase in funding for street tree maintenance and green thumb staffing for our local community gardens. Um, more specifically, we have three playground associates that have been, um, are right now uh, paid for through a deal between the MTA, um, which took over staffing, um, the Second Avenue subway, and we need to see those playground associates bus baselined in this year's budget. And we'd really like to see um, Poor Richard's playground also renovated. Um, and so um, I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Winfield. Ec excellent points. And we thank this panel. We'll move on to the next one. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to hear from Kelly Vicker from Let's Rebuild Cromwell Coalition. Virginia uh, Reboff and Edna Figueroa from El Puente. John Butler from Friends of Van Cortland Park. And Paulette Spencer from the Bronx Community Health Network. All right. Ali, would you like to kick us off? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay. Um, first of all, running for the ferry over here, I uh, have some misspellings on here, so I got to apologize for that. Um, my name is Kelly Villar, and I represent the Let's Rebuild Cromwell Community Coalition on Staten Island. Uh, the Let's Rebuild Cromwell Community Coalition stands with thousands of Staten Islanders and virtually every elected official, including Council Member Rose, to urge our city government to rebuild the Cromwell Recreation Center. This is a major capital project that Staten Island and our city needs right now. 
I want to remind you that on October 9, 2015, a 16-year-old boy fell to his death playing on a, in an abandoned building on the north shore of Staten Island. This was only a few blocks from where Eric Garner was killed. Up until seven years ago, and a stone's throw away, was where Cromwell once stood. Right at the physical center of these unfortunate events, and it stood there for 73 years. Cromwell was the largest public recreation center on Staten Island that served an average of 750 people daily. And I promise you, there's no place on Staten Island where people with 750 people get together. Uh, youth from all over the island had frequented Cromwell since the 1950s, and as a result of years of storm and shoreline damages, our center was demolished in 2010. Finally, all hopes of it had of all hopes of it of ever being rebuilt were ravaged by, of course, Hurricane Sandy. Right now, in the very vicinity of where Cromwell now stand, where Cromwell was, uh, is Staten Island's North Shore waterfront is experiencing the largest economic development project in 30 years. And our community has broken ground on a courthouse for criminals, an observation wheel for tourists, malls with high-end stores for shoppers, and a luxury hotel with exclusive waterfront apartments. But Staten Island hasn't broken ground on a single facility for public use on the North Shore. So I'm urging uh, you know, the council to help us. We've met with, uh, with the speaker about this. We've met with several council members about this. Uh, we are engaging the mayor on a discussion on this, but this is becoming an issue of um, really dire need because now it's a race for space. And, um, and the commitment, and we're losing kids. There are no rec centers of this size, of, of even close to this size, uh, on Staten Island. And um, I really urge the council, if you can help us, uh, getting this into the budget. It is a big ask, uh, but we think that Staten Island has waited a long time and deserves it. There's no doubt the North Shore is gaining population, and we need to do more to enhance public space there to meet that demand. So we thank you for running to the ferry today. Uh, <laughs> sorry for mispronouncing your name earlier, Ms. Bilar, but we're, we're happy that you came and spoke out. Um, not sure which one is Virginia and Edna, but are you all a team? Okay, take it away. Oh, yes. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity of letting us speak. My name is Virginia Rebert. I am a community organizer at El Puente. That's a nonprofit organization in, in Brooklyn, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, the south side of Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And uh, I've, I was born and raised there in Williamsburg, so I know the neighborhood for many years. All throughout my childhood, I lived there. I seen the changes that everyone else seen. Um, I seen the poverty, I seen the poorness, I seen the gentrification, so I've seen it all. And there's been a lot of changes. One thing that did not change was uh, our air pollution, our air pollution. Um, we at El Puente are now conducting with an organization called Mother South Front and our youth, we're conducting um, air monitoring and it's extremely high. So this is the second time El Puente has this campaign on the air pollution. So uh, we're here to advocate for the BQ Green uh, the BQ Green is a project that was designed uh, by Borough uh, President Diana Reina. And so we have worked very close with her because she is originally from our neighborhood. So we actually working very close with mothers and students to do this uh, study. So we did the study as a pilot and now we got funded by different universities. So. We're working with different groups and different organizations. So we're here to bring our, our project, which has had been mentioned at the beginning. And I was very happy it has been mentioned because um, to work and see the numbers that we see, unfortunately, it was a last minute call, so I don't have the numbers with me. Um, but it's amazing how I live there. Maybe I got used to it. Um, but when you see the numbers and you could breathe by right by the edge of the Williamsburg Bridge. It's, it's stunning. And I also want to share that uh, two of those parks have kids that go there for their recreation because they just, um, for example, if they're charter schools, they don't have their own gym and they're sharing with the public school system their gym. So when they have recess, that's the parks that these children go to. So for the health of, of the children 
and for the families that live there, I came to advocate for this big project. Again, like I have heard through the day, it is a big project, but I think it's more important the health of our children. I am an asthmatic, born and raised there. My son is also an asthmatic, and I personally have the experience to bring him to that park and taking him to the emergency room right after. Then not knowing why and now knowing why, my passion is really, really strong now as a mother and as a community member. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Virginia. And Edna? Good afternoon. I also work for El Puente Community-Based Organization, but I am coming as a lifetime resident of Williamsburg. I was born and raised there, and I am here to support Green Thumbs and um, the Parks Department. We have a beautiful garden on South Second between Roebling and Driggs, and it's um, green, oh, a few of the green spaces and it's um, very community um, oriented and the community comes out and they they have their lunch there on Saturdays, Sundays. You have see children playing in our um, garden. And Green Thumb and the Parks Department has helped us a lot in building the beds and building um, a stage and just making the overall look of the garden inviting. And without them, we couldn't have done it because we are volunteers and we just make but so much. But they give us volunteers and they help us build these beds. And without them, I, it would just be a hole in the wall, an apartment building. And we are so grateful for them. So I'm just here to support them as a community member. Thank you. Well, we're happy to hear that. I'm a big, big supporter of the BQ Green. Uh, have been uh, since Council Moreno's days and, of course, Councilman Reynoso is a huge booster, and he and I have worked together on this, and we're going to keep pushing for a project that would really transform people's lives in a very, very needy area. Thank you. So thank you. We thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Spencer? Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you very much for having this meeting, Councilman Levine and the rest of the committee. Um, my name is Paulette Spencer. I am the community engagement and policy analyst for the Bronx Community Health Network. And I work with a project called the Bronx Reach Champs for Parks and Open Spaces. Reach stands for racial and ethnic approaches to community health. And what we are doing through this uh, CDC Center for Disease and Control uh, Prevention uh, granted, uh, excuse me, I'm a little nervous, forgive me. We were funded by the CDC. And Bronx Community Health Network is a 501c3 federally funded health center where we provide subsidized primary and preventive medical care in 12 clinics run by the Montefiore Medical Center and the Acacia Network in the Bronx, and six clinics in public schools. Our services are available to community residents regardless of their ability to pay. And in addition, through our community health worker, health educator and patient navigator programs, we increase access for community residents to social services and address health literacy in our communities. So my project, Bronx Reach Champs for Parks and Open Spaces, in partnership with New Yorkers for Parks and the Montefiore Office for Community and Population Health, is taking steps to increase physical activity in parks, parks, park, Bronx parks by making parks more accessible to community residents and thereby improve health outcomes. From May to August of last year, our 34-member strong coalition for community partners, uh, of community partners for parks and open spaces, brainstormed on ideas to increase access to Bronx parks. The outcome included the park, park, a series of park work, uh, workshops and a series of colorful and informative park visitors' guides prepared by New Yorkers for Parks, which includes a park map, a description of park facilities, and instructions on how to obtain park permits. In late summer of 20, 2016, Park visitors found a space for mental relaxation, educational resources on nutrition and food demonstrations, and physical fitness in seven central and northeast Bronx parks, including Shoelace, Seton Falls, Poe, St. James, DeVoe, 
Sound View, and Aqueduct Parks. During our uh, outdoor activities... And, and, and if, you can, if you can just wrap up, Holland, because we're short on time. Sure. Sorry about that. Um, we are interested in um, strengthening our parks programs. We have uh, trained the trainer programs to provide community residents with their ability to learn some of the techniques to a relaxation so that they can teach each other and utilize the parks more um, in ways that could benefit their help, and we are seeking your support right. for our Thank parents. you, and, and I couldn't agree more with the link that you point out between the physical space of a wonderful park and our health. Uh, it's been proven time and again, and it's great to hear a health professional making that case here. So thank you for coming out. Thank you. Mr. Butler. All right, thanks for having me today. Um, my name is John Butler, and I'm the Ecological Project Manager at uh, the Friends of Van Cortland Park. You normally see my boss, Christina. Um, she's on vacation, so I'm here in support. Um, so first of all, uh, I, on behalf of the staff of, and the boards of, of the Friends, um, I want to thank Councilman Andrew Cohen um, uh, for his vital support of the Friends and of Van Cortland Park, as well as uh, we are extremely thankful of, of you, Councilman Levine, for your uh, support on our efforts to Daylight Tibbetts Brook. Um, so just uh, if you don't know, the Friends are an independent community-based organization um, that actively promotes the conservation and improvement of Van Cortland Park uh, through environmental education, restoration, and enhancement, and we, were, we began in 1992. Um, so basically with the, with the third largest park, or the, with the first largest park in Pelham Bay and the third largest park in Van, uh, in Van Cortland in the Bronx. Uh, the, bar, the Bronx has more parkland than any other borough, um, but we often wonder if we're getting our fair share of the budget uh, to maintain these parks and keep them up to the levels that Bronx sites deserve. Um, so for the upcoming fiscal year, the Friends uh, are looking to request funding for the following projects. One is, uh, is Daylighting Tibbetts Brook. So uh, New York City Parks is in the process of designing phase one of this project, uh, which involves wetland restoration uh, within Van Cortland Park to begin decreasing the amount of brook water entering the city's sewer system. Uh, Daylighting Tabus Brook has been a potential project for about 20 years, uh, and we've made tremendous progress over the last couple of years. But we need to keep that momentum going and begin phase one as soon as possible. Since um, December 2015, the Friends have been monitoring the water quality of Tibbetts Brook and its importance to the biodiversity of, of New York City. Uh, two is the, the Friends have a trails plan for Van Cortland Park, and we're, we're um, really in, uh, in depth in the maintenance of the hiking trails, the 20 plus miles of hiking trails in the park, and, um, and we'd like to make some more significant progress on our trails plan. And the third is just shadowing what many other people said, which was maintenance funding. Um, we see a lot of uh, money go to capital projects, but we need to maintain those as well um, after, after they're done. So um, friends fully support the New York City Parks Department and, and our efforts to maintain and improve all the parks in New York City. Thank you, John. You know, I'm a big supporter of the park and of the Tibbetts Brook Daylighting Plan, and I look forward to continuing to push with you for that. Thank and thank you very much, panel. Okay, our final panel, we're going to try and squeeze in. We have seven speakers uh, on the topic of Roosevelt Park. So I'm going to ask uh, Cleo Dana, Judith Calamandre, okay. William Roddenbush, uh, Regina Karp, Claudia DeSalvo, Fritz Mueller, Carrie Goodman. And I'm, I'm happy that you are so well represented here. Uh, I will just ask in the interest of time if you could, if, if one of your colleagues has already made a point, you could not repeat it, that would be very helpful. And ma'am, why don't you start us off? Go ahead, ma'am. You can start us off. Thank you. I should start? Yeah. Okay. Press the button. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to express our community's opposition to the proposed funding for the expansion of the American Museum of Natural History 
onto Park's property. I am president of the Friends of Damrosh Park and the member of the Committee for Environmentally Sound Development. We were the lead plaintiffs that brought a suit against New York City Parks uh, under Adrian Venepe, New York City under Mayor Bloomberg, and Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts under Ren Levy. Plaintiffs were successful in ousting the powerful conglomerate Fashion Week from Damrosh Park in 2014. Equally impressive, our settlement agreement required that Lincoln Center restore the park. New Yorkers were horrified to wake up one morning in 2010 to find 47 trees in Damrosh Park cut down, the famous Dan Kiley Gardens decimated, and the park closed to the public. Shamefully, Park's department was complicit in the destruction of those beautiful established shade trees without any notice to the community. Trees that were listed as healthy on the park's own website were criminally destroyed without so much as a mandatory forestry permit. A jewel of a park that served the community so well was destroyed overnight while our elected officials said nothing. Today, park advocates oppose the destruction of another idyllic setting less than a mile away. We oppose the destruction of established trees by a museum that exists to teach the public about the glory of our natural habitat. We oppose the taking of one spoonful of Teddy Roosevelt Park, a little oasis that has served the community so well as a retreat in an overbuilt community in order to build an incongruous, massive, $350 million edifice that will primarily serve as an entertainment venue purporting to be a center for innovative science. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for being very timely. We appreciate that. Go ahead, ma'am. Hello. My name is Judith Calamandrea. I live on West 79th Street. I am a neighbor of the park and the museum. A week ago, the day before St. Patrick's Day, there was a very timely illustrated article in the Times. And the headline is, Thinking Inside the Footprint instead of being exhorted to think outside the box. Here are examples of other museums and institutions with an amount of money expected to do this being a fraction of the 300 and something million here that the a Museum of Natural History proposes to put their, I call it a mini Guggenheim Museum there. When you look, or if you have a minute to read this, and I hope you will, there are, there are statements here from, among others, the dean of the architectural school at Yale, which knows gang associates, and they are saying that it is unseemly at this time, and even someone says tone deaf, to go ahead with the idea of new large buildings, and in our case, taking away from this tiny little a park which has nothing to spare, which is well used, Everybody loves it. Why put a wall around the trees and by their own description have a couple of trees and benches inside? They're already outside. You don't have to do anything with wise use of you got to do with what you got. All right. Thank you very much. I realize we skipped one of your colleagues. Are you here to speak as well, ma'am? 
and then we'll continue down the line. Okay, go ahead, sir. I'll go ahead. Um, I'd like to pivot a little bit and uh, talk about something that's uh, near and dear to uh, your heart, Chair, and your heart, Council Members, which is transparency. It's um, bewildering as a citizen the opaqueness and the impenetrable nature of the Parks Department when it comes to their budget, when it comes to their um, items on their budget. I know you've done great work so far, and I know that uh, 1340 is progressing, so you can get updates on capital projects. But let me be positive about the um, effects of having transparency when it comes to the budget in the Parks Department. One of the things is you can be engaged in public-private partnerships in a meaningful way in order to further the vast resources of the private citizen when it comes to their capital projects and their park. This helps us with those stats like I think we're all bewildered when we heard 200 plus acres per gardener. You know, when you can start funding these uh, wealthy neighborhoods and their parks, you can start spreading resources everywhere, but you can't do it without transparency. The reason you can't do it is because you can't go advocate for something that in turn turns into a boondoggle for several years and when you go to check in on it, for instance, we've got a project going right now in Teddy Roosevelt Park that uh, we heard from the Parks Department in 2015 about this dog run and it was all funded and everything else and now it's supposed to be finished this month. We haven't yet to see a shovel. It's between somewhere in one and three million dollars. It's separated into five pieces under the same code over several parks and we have no clue about this project. Now, I'll tell you about this uh, museum. When you're sitting there and you're a member of a community and you see that a museum and a conservancy, I put that in quotations, and um, the Par Department of Parks have a memorandum of understanding to manage your park, and you have them saying that they don't want money for the park because that would make the park shine and make it difficult for them to build on, and you see that there's $130 million going to this project, and this museum has debt. $477 million when you total it all up and everything is paid off and you wonder how is we as a community supposed to manage our park when all this money is going to them and not going to what it should be going to which is the headroom we need in this budget for the oncoming onslaught to our way of life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. All right, please. I'm Regina Karp. On the Upper West Side of Manhattan is a very small park, Theodore Roosevelt Park. On a quiet morning in springtime, it seems wonderfully at odds with the surrounding city. It pits green sward against the city's sharp angles, green life against brick and asphalt, winding paths against the unbending streets of New York's remorseless grid, into which it has been squeezed as if in a vise. On such a favorable morning, Theodore Roosevelt Park resembles nothing so much as a small defenseless principality surrounded by a predatory empire, hostile to its spirit, covetous of its green field, yet miraculously surviving nonetheless, a sort of municipal Liechtenstein. In the least poetical of cities, it makes the unexpected triumph of poetry over practicality and a certain vague sentiment over the hard calculations of interest and profit. Its mission is so singular, so beautiful and gallant, and that is why so many New Yorkers, tourists, and especially Upper West Siders have taken it to their hearts. Let us hope that this little principality can survive in the center of the Empire City. All right, thank you, and thank you for being successful. We appreciate that. Yes, sir. Lift the mic up, sir, just to make sure. There, there you go. Oh, sorry. Great. So now you repeat it again. <laughs> Does it work now? The same name. <laughs> Fritz Müller is still my name. Um, against the uh, allocating of more public money for the expansion of the Natural History Museums Museum into Theodore Roosevelt Park. The, 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 namely the Richard Gilder Center for Science, Education and Innovation. Sci science, Education and Innovation, these, two, these three words serve, in my opinion, only to distract from the real purpose of this uh, of this project, namely 
to create a large brand new entrance for the museum at, uh, at 79th Street and Columbus. A soaring multi-story entry hall, in my opinion, just a, a big vanity showpiece with a, with a billionaire's name on it. it. It does nothing for science, education, and innovation, but it may be a good venue for a fundraiser, for example. And besides the loss of parkland, a large new entry at this spot in Columbus and 79th Street will bring intolerable influx of traffic, uh, foot traffic and vehicular, vehicular traffic into this multi-use and already very overburdened section of Columbus Avenue. Set new center, or set new space for science, innovation, education, which the museum wants to build, minus the new entry hall, could easily be put into the, could easily be created within the underutilized footprint of the present museum. All you have to do is Google, uh, do a um, Google Earth, the museum from the top down, and you see how much space there still is within the museum, especially in terms of volume to, to develop. In this right, context, if, if, just brief, if you could wrap up, Mr. Mueller, so in that we this can... context, I would like to also cite that article by Jane Levine in, uh, about the, how other museums go about their expansions. And the American History National History Museum is the only museum which, in, in this big list of museums, goes outside its footprint. All right, we appreciate that. Anyway. Uh, just briefly, oh, okay. if you could briefly, right. and I'm sure that Mr. Goodman can pick up the baton and continue your line of reasoning. I had the pleasure of listening to the commissioner and all the commissioner's men uh, earlier, so I think I'll integrate that into my remarks if I can. Uh, I'm here, I'm Dr. Carry Goodman, I live not far from the museum, and I'm here to call for Commissioner Silver's resignation. Commissioner Silver, as charged by the charter, is responsible for, and I'm quoting, his duty to manage and care for all parks. Instead of managing Teddy Roosevelt Park effectively, this commissioner has targeted it. And I heard you, Mr. Chairman, talk about targeted investments earlier in the, in the uh, session. The $8 million that you mentioned as a heavy lift of the gap between what the commissioner says is coming to uh, this fiscal year 18 budget and what is needed, that $8 million is back in the budget again this year by our council member, your colleague, Helen Rosenthal, for another eight million to go to the Museum of Natural History. Now there's already been, and there's some dispute, between 100 and 130 million dollars steered into this project without one Parks Committee hearing on it, without one Community Board hearing on it. The first time this conversation ever took a public forum was in the Parks Department scoping session last April. Without any dialogue, without any communication, and it's really a tragedy. You mentioned uh, earlier that there are a lot of things that the parks need to have happen for them. Uh, we couldn't agree more. The $100 million could be clawed back since there's not been a building permit or you know, a green light given to the project and, to, and could be used uh, for many of the things that you outlined. Uh, Commissioner Silver himself mentioned earlier that he wants to have a more equitable park uh, system for all New Yorkers. What sense does it make to put another cultural institution into the Upper West Side? I know you're a neighbor. Lincoln Center, already the Museum of Natural History, New York Historical Society, Manus, Children's Museum, they're all within a few blocks. If this is a great cultural center for all New Yorkers, let's put it somewhere else where other New Yorkers will have the kind of access that we as Upper West Siders have. So I urge you, if you're not going to ask for the commissioner's resignation, would you be kind enough to convene a parks committee hearing where people like these good folks here who live near the museum, we have over 4,000 signatures of people who don't want this, where okay. that kind of a Got dynamic you're, can you're, take you're place. You're over time. Uh, I asked the questions around here, not vice versa. <laughs> we don't do hearings on individual park projects. We've never done one during my tenure. We focus on broad policy here. Uh, did you have a uh, comment as well, ma'am? Okay, take it away. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. My name is Claudia DeSalvo. I'm president of Community United to protect Theodore Roosevelt Park. Um, 
after $130 million of taxpayer money, taking seven trees, losing our canopy, losing our park, the museum continues to have a voracious appetite. Their appetite can be traced back to the 1800s, where in 1885, they made a presentation to the Committee for Appropriations to build more lecture halls, more rooms for teachers, and where they would need more space for exhibitions and dioramas, et cetera, et cetera, and they were turned down in 1885 for this expansion. It is time for our city to start turning down to the more powerful elite in this city who have access to, to so much. Hundreds of organizations come to you with budgets that are so stretched for assistance. When, we, when the hurricane hit and NYU lost its library, they have now completed a digital medical library that's one room. The museum wants to build an event center. They want to add more space for events, making more for the revenue streams to bring in more money. This is not going to be an area of science. And what about what we're living in today. If we're thinking as a museum for the 21st century, we, can, we are now moving into interactive digital work. There should be a Gilder cloud, a Gilder cloud that will expand and bring this museum into a world-class educational setting. I've been an educator for 47 years. We don't need more classrooms. We don't need more brick and mortar. We don't need to take park from people where once it's cemented and rolled over, we will never have the opportunity. You need to speak to the people in our community to understand the passions, the history, how they feel about this park, leaving them and of course, what we will lose with the fact of what we will have with pollution, what we will have with our transportation systems, what we'll be having with all for three years of construction, what we're going to have to lose. So we would appreciate for your consideration, and we need an interactive museum, not another brick and mortar. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you to all our witnesses today. This is our final panel. This concludes our hearing. Thank you very much.